Good morning, everybody. For those that are sitting on the floor, I promise we didn't put any whoopee cushions on the seats. There, you can come and take a seat if you'd like. It's probably more comfortable. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. My name's Kevin Sabet. Um, I know a lot of you here. The Katka, in many ways, is my second home because if it wasn't for CADCA and coalition movement, I wouldn't be standing here today, uh, probably something like 19 and a half years later uh, from when I first started in my first coalition in, uh, in California. Anybody from California here? All right, great. Um, and uh, so I'm just thankful to the whole coalition movement and really all of you because you all give youth a voice, whether on your boards or in your activities. Uh, in fact, they're essential to the work that you do. And uh, I can tell you now, fast forwarding about 20 years, that what you're doing uh, with youth, especially in your community, is going to have a lasting impact on them. Um, so I thank all of you for that. It's really an honor and a privilege for me to share this podium with uh, such esteemed uh, colleagues of mine and mentors of mine in many respects. Um, Sue Thaw, who all of you know as the CADCA public policy guru, um, and uh, really the person in Washington who is pushing for your interests every single day um, uh, on Capitol Hill in a very, very tough funding environment. So it's wonderful to have her here and to have CADCA such a strong supporter uh, with the work that we do. So welcome, Sue, and thank you so much for joining me. Next, I want to introduce someone um, also from California who um, is a product of CADCA's work as well uh, as being one of the, uh, actually the oldest and one of the largest coalitions in California that has decided in many ways to take the, uh, this marijuana issue head on like many of you are doing. Um, and we wouldn't be here today without him and his work and his staff that are here as well in the audience. Um, but we really, I, I want to thank John Redmond, the Executive Director of Californians for Drug for Youth, who's also a senior advisor to Sam. And then uh, a few gentlemen that I more recently met but have heard and followed their work for years and years through my master's and PhD in this field and, and it is an honor to, to share podiums with them first um, is Dr. Stu Gitlow who's the president of the American Society of Addiction Medicine uh, who's here with us today and, and also recently joined us on the board of uh, Project SAM which we're going to talk a little bit about today so I'm really honored and, and, and thankful to him for that and for his uh, sage advice and wisdom working through medical societies, which is a huge issue that he'll be talking about today. And then finally, last but definitely not least, and the person you are intimately familiar with with his work, and we're so excited to have him on the marijuana uh, issue, David Jernigan, who's standing over there. We're, we, we're going to make room for him <laughs> soon. Um, but uh, has just done amazing work that in, in every respect will feed into um, how we're now going to be dealing with marijuana in terms of the industry. And we're going to talk a lot more about the industry, but David's the one that has put in a um, very fine view for legislators, uh, policymakers, and others the devastating effects of what happens when an, an industry lives off of addiction. Because let's not be, um, well, we can't, I don't think we need to mince words among friends, um, that that's the only way industries make money. And the way that they live off of addiction is to target young people and target vulnerable populations. And David has documented that meticulously. And we are very happy that he extended his stay um, uh, to, to join us here on the panel after the break. So um, don't miss that. As, as I said, uh, you, you all know me, Kevin Sabet. I'm the director of, and co-founder uh, with another mentor of mine who couldn't be here, Patrick Kennedy, uh, of Project SAM, Smart Approaches to Marijuana. Uh, and we're going to talk more about um, this new, uh, you could say, new um, collaboration that we've started. And uh, we are very thankful also to CADCA for giving us this, um, this podium and for giving us this opportunity to talk about it. Um, I'm just going to do a quick overview of the day. I know it looks daunting. We'll try and mix it up with some videos and, and, and other things. We also want to be able to take questions. I think there will be enough time to take questions after everyone's individual presentation. So if you have a question during, during my talk or Sue or Stu or John or David, 
um, hold them until the end of their individual ones, and then we, can, we have microphones here. So I'm going to set the stage for marijuana policy and talk a little bit about what Project SAM is doing and why we're doing it, why we started this. Um, uh, really, we're trying to refresh the marijuana, the anti-marijuana movement. That's how I see it. It's a renewal. It's a refresh of what you have all been working on. Um, for a long time, but, but trying to make it in the eyes of ordinary Americans and voters something new and fresh and something that can be um, discussed w w in the political spheres as well. Um, then we're going to have Dr. Gitlow speak about the, what the medical societies have been doing and his work with the American Medical Association, which has made some news in this uh, area recently, and also the American Society of Addiction Medicine and others. We'll take a break. Uh, after about the 20-minute break, we will um, talk, uh, we'll really hear the, the alcohol presentation, the alcohol experience um, from David Jernigan, and we're very excited about that. Uh, Sue Thaw will talk about um, mining data, framing debates, um, which I think is, is key. I mean, this is the, her specialty and what she's been talking to you about for uh, a long time, but in, I think in a new way she's going to be talking about it today for all of us. And then um, the, the, the end of kind of our uh, this sort of Socratic method here, John Redmond will, will, will wrap it up with what um, SAM affiliates and what many of you are actually doing in the field and just some examples of ways that we've refreshed the message so you can actually um, uh, kind of try and hold on to some of those examples and they're tangible. Uh, we'll go to a lunch break and then after the lunch break we're gonna, uh, we want to break you into regional uh, breakouts where we're gonna um, go through, we have about five different handouts of questions um, so you can assess what the local needs are in your own community on the marijuana policy issue, what actions have been done, what might need to be done, and then we're here, we're with you, we want to be able to offer you feedback on that if it's helpful to you. Um, and uh, uh, now that we're, you kind of have us all gathered here to do that, so we're very excited about doing that. Um, and, and very happy to have all of you here. Is that about cover it for everybody? Okay, wonderful. So let, let's get started with one of my favorite pictures in drug policy, this one. Um, and, and I think what I want to talk about, rather than show you 20 different bullets with citations, and don't worry, we'll get to that, um, I want to try and frame a little bit about, I think, what the discussion of drug policy has, I would say, devolved to. Uh, in this country. Um, th this issue of drug policy, but actually marijuana in particular for a lot of reasons, um, comes with it a lot of baggage. I think people have a lot of misconceptions or maybe accurate uh, perceptions about their own experiences with what's happened over the past 40 to 50 years in drug policy. And we're reaching the point in the United States where the issue is constantly being framed, I think, erroneously and falsely as a quote-unquote war on drugs. Um, in order to uh, elicit opposition um, against what you're doing in your communities. Not opposition necessarily against a quote-unquote war, but an opposition actually against prevention in many ways and against, the, um, and against actually much more sensible policy and programmatic endeavors. So when people think about marijuana especially, um, they bring with it their own experiences. They bring with it the symbolism that it meant during the Vietnam War, for example. The, they bring with it the, um, the, the attitudes from the 70s that a lot of states did have in terms of being discriminatory, that, and they were at that time. They bring with it a lot of their own experiences. We know that five out of six people who smoke marijuana will not become addicted, and for a lot of people, they just know the five out of six, and they then transfer that experience to everyone else's. They see the devastation of alcohol, and with this sort of multi-million dollar movement we'll talk about later, pushing legalization, they then make this, this very strange, actually, to people who actually think about this, but it's very strange um, um, dichotomous discussion between alcohol and marijuana as if, you know, uh, one thing is a lot worse than the other, so the thing that's, you know, is, is less worse we should be okay with. Um, and, and, and they have, you know, th this has been a constant messaging for 40 years. So people come with it with this term war on drugs. Just a bit of trivia because I'm a little bit of a drug policy junkie. Um, uh, the term war on drugs is often attributed to Richard Nixon, which is false. Um, he, he did talk about a war on crime and a war on drugs, but actually the war on narcotics, as it was called, was coined by the Washington Post in the early 1900s at a time when we did not have federal drug policy, and actually every state and locality was doing their own thing, and it was chaotic, uh, to say the least. We, there was no FDA, um, or it was just in its birth and in its infancy, and um, so there was actually a call by, believe it or not, the Washington Post that we needed a coordinated war on, on narcotics, or they even called it war on narcotic evil. 
Um, and, and obviously, in many ways, Richard Nixon took some of that rhetoric when he talked about crime. The irony about him, real quick, is that um, he, his budget, if many of you might know this, was four-fifths devoted to treatment. Um, he more progressive and liberal in drug policy than any president since, which is interesting because when you look at this picture and you think about Richard Nixon, you don't think of him as the guy who was the first person to pioneer methadone among drug addicts in Washington, D.C. You know, he was the one who signed off on that. You don't think about that. But that's, I, I talk about this not because I'm a history junkie, but without the pun, sorry, but, but actually <laughs> because um, I, it's, a, it's an important symbol about how this whole discussion has gotten muddled. And sometimes we have contributed to that muddle because we see what's going on in our community and it angers us. I mean, we're furious when we hear people talk about it's actually not a big deal. My friends use it and it's fine. Um, look at the disproportionate sentences and then we look at our statistics and say, wait a minute, there are two people that, you know, in the last three years that have been in jail for marijuana. You're saying that there are, you know, 200 people every day. That doesn't make sense. It is very, very frustrating because we're in this constant battle for facts and, and talking points. But I think when we step back, we can see that, um, that there is a lot of confusion. And so the confusion has fed this dichotomy in society today that I think many of you heard, have heard me talk about, um, that our choices for marijuana policy are very stark, that there are basically two choices. And that this is what the media and, frankly, the people that are controlling the message, which, let's be honest, is the pro-legalization movement right now. I mean, they are ascendant. There's no doubt about it with this dichotomous message saying, all right, guys, well, you have two choices. Um, you can do what you've done for 50 years with no result, sending untold numbers of people to prison, um, uh, you know, discriminating against every single community you can imagine, and with no results to show for it. There are more marijuana smokers than there were 50 years ago, and really, it's never gone down anyway. It's cheaper than ever. Kids say it's everywhere. Um, and God, the alcohol, are you kidding me? We've legalized that. That actually is what destroys families. So you can stick with this failed policy of incarceration, uh, or they'll say uh, prohibition, um, or we have something new for you to, to, to look at. And the new thing is, um, it's great, because the, in, in Europe, it's working out perfectly. Um, you know, this is the, really the only way that we can um, uh, take, take this issue back, because we all know none of us want kids to use it, and they'll say that, but, but really, for law-abiding adults, what's the big deal? Let's control this. We have no control. It's in the black market. Let's control it. Let's put our hands around it. Let's control it. We're not going to have, you know, uh, high-level THC marijuana because we can regulate that. And so the buzzword is regulation. So you'll never hear the word legalization. In fact, I did an hour-and-a-half debate in Washington State with the person that wrote um, I-502, a brilliant woman who were, who's the, who sort of worked for the ACLU then. And um, we were, PBS gave us, if you can believe it, like 75 minutes on, on Washington State television to do one-on-one -on -one de debate with the League of Women Voters. The word legalization did not come out of her mouth once in the debate. And that's on purpose, because we're talking about something called regulation, something that we can actually control. And so when presented with these two stark options, um, you know, it's, it's very difficult, I think, for people that, you know, are frustrated, as you are, with the fact that marijuana is out there, with the fact that every time we eradicate, it seems like there's more going somewhere else, with the fact that we cannot deny there's been disproportionate uh, issues in our criminal justice system overall. These are all frustrating to us, and they're true. And so when we look at that, and when Americans look at that, um, they are increasingly going to the side of, let's try something new and actually control and regulate it. You know, we can even maybe make some tax money off of it, right? Um, so why would we want tax money to go to the, you know, violent cartels? Let's have it come to the, come to the government. Um, and, and that's the decision we're making. The, the other way that they have just perfectly frame this. And you've heard me say this, we need to hire their PR people because <laughs> um, it's brilliant. It's actually brilliant. Congratulations to the, to the person that came up with this message because it has changed the trajectory of, of policy in a, in a relatively you know, unknown policy area. It has made it mainstream. Sue can talk about that as well and will. Is this idea of voting for uh, compassion for the sick and dying. That's the reframing of this issue. And that's how it started 20 years ago. That this is not about the guy who just wants to get stoned. This is actually about um, the fact that you might have cancer one day and this has proven to, to, to make you feel better. Why would you deny somebody that? Opium, opiates are deadly. And yet we hand them out like Skittles. 
So you're saying you want to deny that? What an uncompassionate person you are. And that's been extremely effective because you just need a one second sound bite, no matter what the, uh, what the problems are. And I, I see people shaking their head because it's frustrating that <laughs> we were dealing with it. It's very, very frustrating. Um, the other issue is reducing our prison population and drug-related crime, right? So many people in prison and jail, largest incarcerator in the world. That's not a badge of honor. I think that's not something to be happy about. Um, in the industrialized world, we beat out Russia and China like there's no tomorrow. And so, well, if we legalized, we wouldn't have all these people, right, clogged up, clogging up our prisons, stimulating the economy. Let's pay for prevention and treatment, schools, health care. In Washington State, it was sold to, uh, in Colorado, actually, sold to pay for schools. Um, it actually, and it even says that in the amendment. We will be go to public school construction, um, the, uh, the oodles of money that will be made. And um, this is something that's promised. And, of course, ending violence. Let's look at Latin America. Let's look at the fact that there are countries without proper infrastructure that are being corrupted by the drug trade. Now, that is the true statement. Countries without proper infrastructure corrupted by the drug trade. We can, very difficult to deny that. Um, but this is presented as a solution, however, to, to ending that violence, as if they would do that. And the fact is, frankly, they are winning. You've, talked, you've heard me talk about um, that support as legalization has reached unprecedented levels, higher than the levels we saw in the 1970s. Um, we're looking at some different polls. When you aggregate the polls, it's 50-50. Or, 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 or maybe 51, um, and, and it's very, very, very difficult when you look at this on a national level. We've had researchers look into projecting the future depending on what baby boomers and my generation end up thinking about marijuana, because in the 70s, we were also going towards this, by the way. We were going towards legalization. We even had a president who took up a minute of a State of the Union address and said we need to have a discussion about marijuana to make sure the penalties are not harsh. Um, and at that time, we were going towards legalization. What switched it was baby boomers had kids in 1980. And all of a sudden, they decided, well, wait a minute, I might have used this you know, for fun at, at Kent State, but I, I actually um, don't want uh, my kids using it. And they did switch. The big question now in terms of the cohort is what will my generation do when, I, when we start to have kids? And will we say, you know what, it's really not as bad as alcohol, because that's the messaging we're getting. We're all getting that message. And will we then say, you know what, if I, if I have to choose, I, want, I guess I want my kid to smoke marijuana. Maybe they can do it responsibly. I'll know that they're doing it. And of course, we, we played, played that game with alcohol for 30 years. I don't have much to show for it, but these things are forget, you know, people forget. <laughs> and so, you know, my generation that, that didn't live through that experience then says, you know what, most people use it, they don't have a problem with it, so maybe I'm okay with it. That's going to be the big question for as we look at population changes. We, we will see. So what can we do? This is something that we've talked about a lot. Basically, I've said over and over that we are on a fast track uh, to legalization but we have not had a proper discussion of the pros and cons. There are pros and cons with every drug policy, and I'm not gonna stand up here and say that current marijuana policy has no cons. I'm not gonna stand up here and say that drug policy overall has no cons. We, have, we do have an exploding prison population. We do need to do much more about prison reentry. It's, you know, we expect a different result when we, and we keep releasing people into the community thinking they're gonna be fine and not reoffend, and we don't invest in that. That's a problem. I mean, we're not gonna get results if we keep doing that. So we can have that honest discussion, but we're not having that with marijuana at all because we, right now we do not control the message at all. And so what, what I've been saying is if we don't act now, we're going to be responsible for ushering what I am convinced would be an irreversible policy if we went to national legalization and the industry um, with all of their interests. That will destroy the lives of millions if that happens. Um, and so we, we, we do have to act now because we're outspent. I think we do not have all the right messengers at the table. And we are seen as old-fashioned, moralistic, uh, and unscientific. Um, we are often on the defensive. As I told you, I sympathize with you. We're, all, I'm, we're always on the defensive because it's infuriating when somebody has 10 seconds to talk about medical marijuana. And rather than say, well, there are components in marijuana that actually work, and we need to do the research to make sure you can get your drug from your pharmacist, not from the um, kid on a skateboard selling it for cash only. Um, we're not able to get that message out. The message instead is, this helped my grandmother, and if I get cancer, I'm going to want it, and who are you to tell me not to smoke something that has not killed one person before, and you, yet you want me to take morphine that kills 23,000 people a year? And that's a very difficult message, and which we have to come up with being more on the offensive. Um, but I do think we can turn this around, as I've talked to you about, and this is what Project SAM really is about. Some of you have heard me talk about this. We do need a smart approach. We do need to talk about how this is not about legalization or incarceration. We can be against legalization and also 
really dislike current criminal justice policies that, that just you know, recycle people through the system. We can be against legalization and not be a big fan of three strikes and you're out or mandatory minimums for 20 years for a small possession on the federal level, even if it's never applied. But we can be. But we haven't had a chance to get that message out. So this is how Sam was really birthed with this idea that we want to be a new collaborative working with the troops. And you are the troops, by the way, <laughs> in the field. That's why we're here. Um, to get new messages that have been refreshed so we can actually take control of the debate. So I got a call from Patrick Kennedy, who I had worked with at the White House when I was there, on parity issues, who had not expressed any interest in looking at the marijuana issue. And who essentially said, you know, Kevin, I'm, mental health is my number one issue, and parity, and making sure that mental health and addiction are treated like every other illness. In fact, he was the one who introduced the piece of legislation that I guess we had to wait till 2010 to be enlightened about, that the brain was part of the body. That was not, that has not been codified in American law prior to that, to, to that, that parity law. So he said, look, we, there is so much misconception about marijuana. Everyone I know thinks people are in prison for something that is harmless. And yet when I go and do my research with the head of the National Institutes of Health, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and I listen to the medical societies, which you're going to hear straight from in a minute, that is not the message I hear. What is this disconnect about? I mean, where, how is this happening? As we are learning more about science and about the harms, literally with that trajectory, at the same time, we're okay with policies that widen availability use and create an industry that's going to prey on kids. What, how did that happen? <laughs> And so we, we, you know, we got into a bit of a discussion about this and decided, look, we need a right-left coalition to come together that's not about political parties, that's about the science, led by people that some folks have heard of, and then backed by the top public health experts. Because frankly, other than a few people in this room right now, and I think Dr. Gitlow will attest to this, marijuana is not an issue necessarily that even the, a lot of the people that research the issue want to talk about in terms of policy. Okay, this is a sticky issue for a lot of people. I, I've heard stories about folks who are treating addiction. I mean, you know, they're, they're the ones who are actually addiction doctors and they're questioning because they see it as this dichotomy that we either have to put people in jail and criminalize everybody for something or we have to legalize. And so with that, as someone who's a health worker, you would go for something that does not criminalize, whatever that is. And so we said, look, we need to get those, we need to create a safe space, a vehicle for these public health experts to come together and we need to make a, a bit of a stink about this nationally. We need to blow this up nationally to change the conversation. And obviously, if it wasn't for someone like Patrick Kennedy or David Frum, who was George W. Bush's speechwriter throughout the, um, the war on terror. So, I mean, I, I don't, they've never shared a podium before, by the way. So the first time they did, it was a little scary. I was nervous, but everything went out okay. Um, but they did as this right-left coalition with public health experts right behind them, with the head of you know, pediatrics with the, at Harvard, with the person that's been studying um, the impact of this on the brain from, uh, you know, funded by NIH. So th this, was, this was what we wanted to do. And we really wanted to get, make a stink about this in the press and get this out there with a message. So there are four pillars essentially that, uh, that we believe in, that we're trying to accomplish. The first is just to inform the public in language they can understand with the science about today's marijuana. Not the marijuana they smoked at a, you know, at a UCLA dorm room in 1973, that was 1% THC, the marijuana of today that's sending people to the emergency room because of acute um, psychotic episodes, 400,000 people a year that nobody knows about. Um, the, the, the marijuana of today that is contributing to mental illness. I mean, you ask the advocates, it's not an issue they really want to be talking about. The science isn't there for them, the, the, the pro-legalization advocates. So let's get this science out there because we don't think parents know this. We think that they're constantly hearing messages that alcohol is better for you and this actually isn't that bad because five out of six people get away with it. And those five people are the ones that I know statistically. Um, and w the second thing was, and this was something that actually both Patrick and David were adamant about, let's have honest conversations about current criminal justice policy. I mean, does it make sense in certain jurisdictions to, even if it's for local jails because of arrests, to do, it doesn't make sense to have that. Does it make sense for procedures for local police that it takes two hours for them to process somebody if they pull someone over and they happen to have marijuana in their car? Because that frustrates them. Uh, well, let, let's think about our process there and how we do deal with it. Does it make sense to stigmatize somebody who gets arrested or gets cited at age 17 with a ticket and by age 25 still can't get the job that they wanted because of a criminal record? 
that's, a, that's an honest conversation that we have been unable to have because it, 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 you know, it's not perfectly in line with against, being against what the legalization advocates are saying. But we, we thought it's very important to put that out there. Thirdly, it's very important to talk about legalization, not as legalization, but as commercialization. Okay? This is not about a couple of my old friends from Berkeley smoking pot in People's Park on Saturday. Is not, I don't care when that happens. This is not about you know, my parents' friends smoking a joint in their basement after their, you know, their kids have gone to college, they're older, smoking a joint in their basement on Sunday afternoons. Okay? This is not about that at all. That's not what legalization, that's not the effect of legalization. You can pretty much do that now, and you, we've done the stats. You have a 1 in 20,000 chance of even being approached by any kind of actor in the criminal justice system. So your, your chances are pretty good that you're going to get away with that and nothing's really going to happen, including for when you buy it, grow it, whatever, the whole process. This is about commercialization and creating the next big tobacco, period. Period. We have seen already what's happening in Washington, Colorado. This is not a theory, and we're going to talk about this in a minute. This is about creating an industry. So the question is, if you're in favor of the way we're going, you're okay with an industry. We fought big tobacco for 50 years. We're now seeing the same tactics, the vending machines, the partnering with um, social institutions. You all know about how cigarette companies worked very closely with homeless shelters for 25, 30 years to do product placement and for vulnerable populations. Now, you're the ones that know that liquor store outlets are eight times more prevalent in poor communities of color in our major cities than they are in upper class white neighborhoods. So we know there's an industry there that is targeting. So the question is, are we going to call them out for what they are now to try and prevent it? Or are we going to be in this delusion that this is just about people who want to smoke a little weed and not get in trouble? Because that has been the way this has been framed, and we cannot take that bait. We have to be out there adamant about trying to prevent the third public health disaster, because frankly, we're dealing with two already, with alcohol and tobacco. They provide no model for us. And fourth, the elephant in the room with medical marijuana. 77% of Americans, when you ask them if someone dying of cancer should be able to smoke marijuana, say yes. Many people in this room probably know somebody, if not themselves, who have said, you know what, for those people that have an extreme debilitating illness, I really don't care if they shoot heroin in their arms the last month of life. I want them to feel better. And if it's smoking marijuana, I'm probably okay with that. And again, that's how this issue has been framed. So we lose when we're the ones saying, well, wait a minute, there's actually shouldn't be smoking. It's not FDA approved. You know, we all trust the FDA now, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's sad, but yeah, exactly. There are laughs when we talk about that, which is sad because 100 years ago, we all needed the FDA to make sure we weren't buying snake oil and to make sure that the Advil in Maine was the same Advil in, or Motrin in uh, California and the same Motrin you get in, in Hawaii, that there was some standardization. We don't want to go back to the Stone Age, but we, a lot of Americans, like they've lost confidence in government, have lost confidence in a, a group like the FDA, unfortunately. And so a lot of folks are willing to say, you know what, I hate big pharma. So have at it with your natural herb. I hear it's not that bad for you. And if you're dying of cancer, I could care less. So we want to take that elephant in the room and flip it completely and say, yeah, we are in favor of, of using parts of marijuana as medicine. But let's talk about what that looks like. It doesn't look like smoking a big fat joint that's called, you know, super silver haze that you buy from the 23-year-old skateboarder in a cash only, covered with bars, 500 pound bouncer guarding dispensary in downtown LA. It should be about you going to your pharmacist that you know and trust and getting something that at least gone through some testing so you know what's in it and is somewhat safe. I mean, obviously not everything that is prescribed is the safest thing imaginable, but it goes through some standards. And so we're able to say, yeah, let's take the constituents and make them into medicines. It's an exciting area of research. But that doesn't mean you smoke it. Do we smoke opium to get the effects of morphine? Why would we smoke marijuana to get the effects of marijuana? As good as some of those effects might be. That we're not denying the cancer patient is, saying to, you know, is lying to our face. What incentive do they have to lie to our face, stage four cancer, six months to live? I'm not calling that person a liar. And we lose if we do that, by the way. It's not, it doesn't make sense on any grounds to do that. What does make sense is to flip the conversation and say, I'm compassionate like you are. Let's speed up the process to get those medicines together. 
Um, so it really, we have penetrated, I think, the media by focusing on this non-ideological third-way message. And to break this up a little bit, I have our first clip that we, ever, that we have ever done uh, when Patrick was featured on MSNBC. You'll get a, a kind of a taste um, of what, what the message has been. And, you know, this, this was the very first thing that we ever did. And, and people, by the way, real quick, they, they get confused because they think, well, is this decriminalization? You're saying people shouldn't be going to jail. And the answer is no, because the way decriminalization has been presented around this country, the way it's actually been implemented is much more like de facto legalization in a sense, but without the beginnings of an industry. But it's still about eroding those norms. So it, it's not about that, but it is about making sure that we're just and equitable in what we're doing. And, and it doesn't fall under these labels that someone else has defined. I, I we refuse to kind of take that, take that bait. But anyhow, take a look at this. And uh, this was the very first one that we, we ever did. And see what you think. administration is uh, still trying to figure out a legal response to the growing state-by-state -state effort to legalize marijuana. Now, a Kennedy has added the weight of the family name to the fight against the drug. Former Rhode Island Congressman Patrick Kennedy, son of the late Senator Ted Kennedy, leading a group called Project Sam, or Smart Approaches to marijuana. But Kennedy, who has a history of substance abuse himself, is already drawing uh, a fair amount of criticism for his cause. He joins me live here on the set in Washington, D.C. Let's start there with some of the criticism. It, it could not have come as a surprise to you. No, but uh, a good cause like this uh, needs to galvanize attention because it's already in 18 states. It's uh, going even further. And before we know it, we're going to wake up one day and we're going to have another tobacco industry. It's going to be called the marijuana industry. We already know what Big Tobacco did to our kids. Joe Camel targeting kids. We know what the uh, alcohol and liquor industry yeah. has done. They target children. They also market to people who are, are alcoholics, frankly, and they, they uh, flood the market and make it accessible. I don't think we need a new legalized drug in our country. Uh, Michael Bloomberg's taking Oxycontin off the, the shelves in New York City. We have enormous epidemic of addiction and abuse and then the thought that we would introduce a new legalized drug to me just doesn't make any sense. How does your personal experience with substance abuse, I mean you mentioned Oxycontin, you, of course you, you sought treatment for it, it's widely known, how does all of that play uh, into what you're doing now? So I've spent a lot of time researching addiction and the neuroscience behind it. Nine out of ten addicts start when they're kids as I did. That changes your brain chemistry because as your brain's developing, it isn't fully developed until your 20s. So this notion that we're going to give the green light of permissibility for people to think, oh, it's harmless, go ahead and experiment. Now, we know kids have access to this anyway, but we shouldn't be adding fuel to the fire. And my whole point is let's get the public health officials in here and offer other recommendations besides, you know, incarceration, because I'm also against incarceration. Sure. So let's for low level dealers. All right, there's a little. I think mean, that was pretty good. I'm very, I'm very proud of him for, for standing up and doing that. So let's. I'm going to briefly now go through, um, and we're, let's see, 9:22. Go through some of these main messages that were that we're promulgating around. Basically, again, legalization is about normalization, which is more use in addiction. You have seen this five million times. Uh, this graph about changing in, changes in, in perceptions lead to changes in reality for use and attitudes. So that's what we're, when we talk about a permissibility environment, this is what we're talking about. It's the one truism in prevention, right? Perception of risk, low, use, high, done. And, and this has been a truism for over, it's, it's good to look at this for over 40 some years. Um, the message that you're going to be so sick of by the end of the day is this message, but it's true, is that big t marijuana is, is big tobacco. And the question we need to ask people that are trying to regulate this is, can we trust companies and big corporations not to target youth and the vulnerable? Well, so I, you're going to hear, and you're going to also be sick of this, my many book plugs. Um, but anyway, we're selling the book out there called Reefer Sanity, which is published next month, but we brought some advanced copies to sell here that I've signed. And, and in that book, I go through, I do the research on what the tobacco industry actually did for 40 years in terms of targeting kids. Um, other people have gone through it before. I'm not the first person to do it. But it's it really important to remember what actually was said 
40 some years ago. Because we have a, I can't remember what I had for breakfast yesterday. So it's, we have a short memory, all of us, and we need to go back and actually look at, um, look at, look at what's been done. So, you know, what's very interesting is I, I started to look at memos that were literally written in the same months as the industry executives were on testifying on Capitol Hill, saying that they would never target youth. And they were using very interesting phrases that have come up recently in states like Washington and Colorado. This is for responsible users, 21 and older. We've heard that a lot. That we're not advocating youth use. That's dangerous. Okay, we've heard that a lot. We're not advocating irresponsible use or addiction because we believe in treatment. Okay. These same things that were said almost verbatim are being said today and have been said to pass legalization in two states. And so in that same month that they were saying this, they said things like this. Well, why are younger adult smokers important to RJR? Well, only 5% of smokers start after age 24. Less than a third start after age 18. So 70% of our market starts when they're young. Um, and of course, you know, the, the industry says, well, children aren't the only targets of the tobacco industry. Um, and R.J. Reynolds, executive, and his colleague, they, when they said that they didn't smoke, which surprised people in the room, the R.J. Reynolds, by the way, third person, number three person at that corporation, responded point blank that we don't smoke this bleep. Um, we had a, General Dean's in the room, so I'm going to watch my language. <laughs> we just sell it. We reserve that right, sarcastically said, for the young, the poor, the black, and the stupid. Okay? I mean, this is what an industry relies on. And if this damning evidence isn't an indication about what we're going to have coming up, I don't really know how else we could convince anybody. Realistically, if our company is to survive and prosper, this is this other memo of 1973, we must get our share of the youth market. In our opinion, this will require new flavors. David's going to talk about the new flavors for alcohol. Here are the new flavors in that time for cigarettes. Apple flavor, it appeals to girls. Sweet flavor cigarettes are very important. Teenagers like sweet products. Honey might be considered fruit flavored. Chewing, but these are all the different companies. So this isn't one memo in one company. This is just a very small sampling from across, at that time, the sort of four or five major um, uh, corporations, Lorillard now combined. But fruit flavored chewing products, for example. Um, and the marijuana stuff we know isn't even just a theory. Actually, we have evidence that at that time, Brown and Williamson, which is R.J. Reynolds, because they had to consolidate about 50, 20 years ago, um, they, they had a consultant tell them, you know what, the use of marijuana has important implications for the tobacco industry in terms of an alternative product line. Remember, this is the time in the 70s I was talking about earlier with the history. This is the time we were going to what we're doing now. Sort of, we're reliving 1975 right now in, in many ways. So this is what was written. Um, we have the land to grow it, the machines to roll it and package it, the distribution to market it. In fact, some firms have registered trademarks, which are taken directly from marijuana street jargon. Mm -hmm. These trade names are used currently on little-known legal products, but could be switched if and when marijuana is legalized. Estimates in indicate that the market in legalized marijuana might be as high as $10 billion annually. And the issue is we don't actually have to wait. Okay? In many ways, this is already happening. Where is this happening? Well, this is happening. The test case was medical marijuana, quote-unquote. The test case was the advertising on a smaller scale, but that we see in places like California and Colorado. Because the last time I checked, I don't think people with cancer were asking for their ring pots <laughs> or their pot tarts. That's very clear who that is marketing to. We don't have to guess. You know, the grape flavored sodas. We don't have to guess that that's not for the person who doesn't have feeling in their legs or has uncontrollable epilepsy, seizures. I don't think that these target these markets for them. And what's interesting is now we're reliving the nightmares of the past once again. The vending machines that took, you know, decades of fighting for tobacco. We're now seeing the companies emerge with. And this isn't just one prototype. This one company reported revenue last year at a time where marijuana had not been legalized in any state of $3 million. Well, how is that happening? Well, because it's happening under the guise of medicine right now as a test case. So now mainstream media like Fortune and others are picking up on this in some way um, and very interested in the new pot entrepreneurs because that's really what this is about. So galvanized by legalization, these investors are flocking to a new industry. 
And these, frankly, are the gentlemen and people of the new industry. This is what modern marijuana looks like. It looks like a, an investors group called ArcView that's already raised $6 million in about a two-month time frame. What have they raised that money for, you ask? Nothing's actually yet, you can't buy it yet. And who's, well, they're getting ready because there'll have to be products to accompany your marijuana use. So a lot of them are actually playing it safe and saying, we're not actually marketing the marijuana yet because that's still illegal. They haven't promulgated rules. We're getting ready for that by coming up with the products. And so the headline recently was the Yale MBAs are here because these are very, 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 very smart people that realize this is a huge market for them. They, this is the gold rush for them. This is the new Silicon Valley, the new internet. I mean, you have a product that's used by millions of people that it's never been marketed this way. It's a golden opportunity for business. And so they have now invested in all these different things. So there are the machines that hold the units of marijuana to sell, Medbox. There are the lights for, for growing the high concentrated THC. There are the cases and accessories for consumer packaging so you can be discreet. This is the discreet user. This isn't the, you know, the hippie walking down the street you know, barefoot. This is for marketing to the upper um, echelon, as they say. Molded nylon assembly that converts a standard water pipe, uh, paper cup into a water pipe. 20 bucks. Pretty good. Um, and they're very, they're not really nervous about the comments they're making because they're out there saying things like this. The co-founder, Troy Dayton, business is driving this change. Business is the most powerful platform for political change that's existed. When there's money for government, money for investors, money for entrepreneurs and benefits to communities, that's a powerful incentive for change. So they are promising all this stuff to people and saying that we're, we're, ready to, we're ready to do this. But again, as you heard yesterday and you've heard over and over, alcohol and tobacco teach us there is no money in legalization for anyone, for none, not for the communities, not for the governments, other than the investors and the people who buy stock and own these companies. Because that's what's happening right now with alcohol and tobacco, right? Every dollar you get in government taxes, we do tax alcohol and tobacco, you spend 10 in social costs. <clears throat> the, alcohol, the tobacco number is a lowball estimate, by the way. It's, it's 200 to 400 billion for tobacco, for social costs. Well, what do we know about alcohol and tobacco? We know the use levels are much higher, and as we said earlier, industries promote addiction and target kids. We're gonna talk about this. Enjoy responsibly. David will talk about that. Enjoy responsibly, are you kidding me? If every person enjoyed their alcohol responsibly, we would have no alcohol industry. <laughs> because the money isn't made from people that enjoy responsibly. 80-20 rule, look it up. 80% of um, the revenue gained comes from 20% of the people. So I really could care less, if I'm an executive, about you, if you drink a glass of wine with your dinner every night. Not important to me. Important is the chronic drinker who's gonna become an alcoholic and the alcoholics. And so much so that they're important. We know everyone is sensitive to price. All of us are in terms of what we buy. The industry and the lobby is so powerful now that for alcohol, our taxes are a fifth of what they were adjusting for inflation than they were during the Korean War. Now, when I heard that statistic, I had to Wikipedia Korean War because I had no idea what really when it was. It was before my time. Sorry. That's a long time ago. No offense to anybody. But a fifth, 20% of what it was then, okay, not at least on par, should have been raised, but wasn't, no, 20%. <clears throat> and what comes with that alcohol policy? Because again, you're gonna, this is gonna be thrown in your face constantly. Well, we, alcohol, we're fine. You want, let's treat it like that, because we'll have less people go to jail and involved in the criminal justice system. Well, what's the number one drug? Alcohol is a drug. What's the number one drug? that contributes to arrests in the criminal justice system today? I've given you the answer. It's alcohol, folks. It's a legal drug. I know, doesn't make sense. A legal drug contributes to illegal behavior. But it does, why? Well, people are arrested, we have drunk driving laws. Well, we also have laws that are supposed to protect kids, so you can't sell to people under 21. We also have laws that say if you're gonna drink, don't do it publicly, public intoxication. 800,000 people get arrested and booked and sent to jail for public intoxication every single year. So combined, it's 2.7 million compared to the 800 or so thousand for marijuana. Now, well, what about, that sounds like a lot for marijuana. Yeah, it, it might be. And that's what I said, we need to talk about the ramifications of that. 
But let's be very clear about the kind of policy we want to base it on. Is alcohol, if you care about criminal justice, the way to go? Um, and we have some early lessons from Colorado, by the way. I'm going to go through this very quickly. Uh, essentially, Colorado has had de facto legalization since 2010, right? It's just been called under medicine. They've had medical for, since 2001, but they didn't have an industry until about nine years, eight, year, eight years later, let's say eight years, 2009. And they have seen, we have been documenting this. Dr. Chris Thurstone is on our SAM board. I'm going to go through this very quickly. They have seen a lot of the increases since then. Are there other things going on since then? Yes. But the fact of the matter is that that use has increased. Now, a lot of data and science needs to be sorted out to control for other conditions in all the different states, and that's been done. Or that's, that's being done. But when 74% of people at a treatment clinic who are kids are saying they get their marijuana from a dispensary, that's what we call diversion, right? Diversion from the cancer patient, who I thought was the one that was supposed to benefit, to kids. Um, they're even seeing after the passage of legalization, okay, in November. They haven't promulgated rules, so you, can't, you cannot buy marijuana right now. However, the change in attitude from that vote, drug testing companies are seeing increases in quantity and prevalence of marijuana in people in Colorado since November, just because of the perception. Right now, the regulations are being discussed, and we, uh, Derek talked about Washington yesterday, but you know, they are heavily influenced by the massive medical marijuana industry in that, in that state. Unlike in California, where they divided, in Colorado, they, they, they came together. They're allowing character packaging, edibles, et cetera. And they, uh, they banned advertising, and guess what happened the next day? Lawsuit, the judge stated, it. the advertising is not banned right now. Well, that's because we have something called the First Amendment, which I think most of us want to keep. But the reality is commercial speech is free speech. So when you have a product out there, it's, it's up to anybody to do what they want. And they will do what they want. So we're, we're going around talking about what actually a smart approach looks like because it's important to be on the offensive rather than always be responding to folks. And we do, I think, have answers. And that's the thing, is people think that, well, nothing really works. Well, you all know what works in your communities, but folk, a lot of folks don't know that. And we need to talk about this over and over again. So when we go to state legislatures, John is going to talk at the end about what we do locally. When we go to state legislatures and others, we talk about what we're actually for, not, not just what we're against. And there are a lot of things that we're for. I'm not going to go through them. But it, it's, it's important, to, I think, to be, to be on the offensive. So one aspect of what Project SAM is doing um, is this year especially getting more of the medical and public health field on board to feel comfortable about talking about this issue in a safe way. They're not saying we want to criminalize it because again the legalization community will, sell, will say no no medical community they're not with you they, they want to take this as a health issue and if it's a health issue it's not a crime issue therefore that means it's legal. So we're really pushing back against that this year and challenging medical and public health field. And really, the pioneer who's been already doing that for a number of years, and that's why we have gotten him to advise us, is, is Stu Gitlow. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce him to come up. Uh, I'm finished. I, I thank you for listening to me, and I look forward to our discussion uh, later. We'll do questions after, later, later after. Yeah, so let me get you up here. Good morning. Good morning. So if we did word association and I said boy, you'd say girl, I said black, you'd say white. If I said diabetes, you'd say sugar. And yet from a medical perspective, the two don't necessarily go together. It's what everybody thinks. But when I talk about diabetes, although what we see is an individual who has abnormalities of blood sugar, what's actually taking place is an abnormality of the autoimmune system. Doesn't have anything to do with sugar. Until you realize that the autoimmune system is not working properly and is attacking parts of your own body, a part in the pancreas, the islet cells, that are responsible for producing insulin, that's responsible for metabolizing glucose. So a whole chain of events takes place in diabetes. But when we look at the question of what causes it, it's an immune disturbance. The immune disturbance is caused by an abnormality in the individual's DNA. 
They're misprogrammed. They're programmed in a certain way at birth to get diabetes. And yet, if you have identical twins, sometimes you have one who has diabetes and one who doesn't. So there's more to it than the genes. There has to be some environmental event that takes place. We're not certain what that is. Otherwise, we could prevent diabetes by simply identifying the people who have the right genes for it and then making sure they don't go through that environmental trigger that makes it so that the genes start to work. And what I've described just now, which is 100% acknowledged, recognized as true by the entire medical and scientific community, is exactly the same for addiction. No difference whatsoever. Just as diabetes isn't about sugar, although at the end point, when everything has gone wrong, that's what we see, addiction isn't about drugs. Drug use is what we see at the end, after everything has gone wrong. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about addictive disease, we're talking about three building blocks that are necessary. The first building block to addictive disease is the abnormal gene. The gene that's responsible, or genes that are responsible, for an individual having addictive disease. Now, we've got enough people in the room. How many of you brought sunglasses today? Okay. How many of you did not pack sunglasses? Right. And so what we see, we're in Austin. It's sunny and hot down here. We expect things to be tilted a little bit in one direction. What we saw were a bunch of people who bring sunglasses and a bunch of people who didn't bring sunglasses. And if we drew a curve of that in most places, probably not Austin, we'd get what's called a normal curve. It'd be an even distribution of the room of people who brought sunglasses and people who didn't. Now, what are sunglasses? They are a way of making it so that your perception of the stimulus around you, bright light, is reduced. Mm -hmm. Imagine it as a drug. Imagine sunglasses are a drug, and what you're trying to do with the sunglasses is turn the intensity of the world down. So you sit there and you say to yourself, well, all right, why is it some people carry the sunglasses and some people don't? Well, that's easy. We have a normal distribution of the way we perceive the world, just like we have a normal distribution of our metabolism, the, the, our body temperature, our heart rate, our blood pressure, all those things are distributed on a normal curve. So, of course, your perception of the world is also distributed that way in a population. But if you take any one individual, you're going to fall somewhere on that curve. Okay, those of you who brought sunglasses, I am going to call you stimulus augmenters. You are individuals who add something to what the world is providing and then find that more irritating, more annoying, more disturbing, more distressing to such an extent that you've decided you need something outside of yourself to help you deal with that discomfort. Those of you who didn't bring sunglasses, mm -hmm. who don't think of it at all, I'm going to call you stimulus reducers. You're the individuals who really don't notice the stimuli outside. It isn't annoying. You wouldn't even take note of it unless somebody pointed it out to you. Gee, it's bright today. Really, I hadn't noticed. That's what a stimulus reducer will do. So. Imagine I divide the room, stimulus augmenters on one side, stimulus reducers on the other. Which side of the room do you think will like alcohol? The stimulus augmenters, because alcohol as a sedative agent turns the world down. If you look at alcoholics, they're all stimulus augmenters, 98% of them. Every one of them can be tested psychologically to see whether or not there are ways of doing this. I'll give you a simple one. You expose a person in a dark room to a sound, a constant side wave, something like Ooh. Okay, I didn't do a great job, but it was close. <laughs> All right, so there's that constant sine wave. An hour later, you put them back in the room. You say, here's the volume knob. Turn it up to the same level that it was at an hour ago. Stimulus augmenters all turn it up higher. So you can measure whether or not somebody is an augmenter or reducer fairly easily. All right, all alcoholics turns out are augmenters, but not all augmenters are alcoholic. Why? Because there's the second building block of addictive disease, and the second building block is 
the environmental trigger, just like for diabetes. What's the trigger? Well, here we have a benefit. We have an advantage over the diabetics. We know what the environmental trigger is in addictive disease. And I'll tell you a story. Imagine that we've got a little boy, seven or eight years old, and the little boy gets uh, put in some sort of gym class where he's asked to play softball for the first time. And the boy isn't sure how to play softball. He's watched a few games, but he doesn't really know how the game is played. And so the other kids know that. He gets put out in right field, where, of course, nothing happens. <laughs> so there he is in right field, standing there, getting sunburnt, counting the clover, watching the airplanes fly overhead, when a shadow flies by, and he hears everyone yelling. And suddenly he notes that there's a ball sitting next to him on the ground. And everybody's running, and he sees, and he hears, and he says, oh, I suppose I'm supposed to do something with this ball. But what is it? Who do I throw it to? Do I throw it at the person running around the bases? Maybe, okay, tosses it. It doesn't really fit in his hand. The ball's too big for his hand, and he doesn't manage to get it to where it's supposed to go. And the kids yell at him, and they lost the game because of problems along the way, but they blame our kid in right field because he was the one who you know, was responsible for the home run. Feeling badly about himself, he goes home and he tells his father what happened. And his father can do one of two things. His father can say, you know, that happened to me too. I think it happens to everybody. Let me take you out for ice cream and then I'm gonna teach you how to play baseball. Or dad can say, yeah, you suck at baseball like you do at everything. That dad, that second dad, is the dad our alcoholics have. The story's the same for girls, except it's not usually about baseball. It's usually that they're being molested or abused in some way, and when they tell mom, mom either doesn't believe them, or says, yeah, it's just something we have to go through, powerlessness, right? Whatever it is, the story is one where the child does not learn a good self-identity and, and learns not to trust other people with their discomfort. So they don't feel good about themselves, and they know that if they tell somebody else about how they feel badly, uncomfortable, that they will be met with disdain or worse. So it takes those two things to make somebody an addict. Genes that make them uncomfortable in the first place and learning that there is no way of dealing with that discomfort through human emotional intimacy. But it takes three building blocks to make addictive disease. You need to be in an environment where there is an alternative to the normal coping mechanisms. If I learn that I'm uncomfortable and that I can't share my feelings with other people, well, I can still function. Unless I discover that some product will make me temporarily feel better. If I learn that, which I can only do in a society that promotes the use of such products and has those products readily available, if I learn that, then I'm done. Because then I'm going to follow this process simply by virtue of the way these drugs happen to work, which is that they work well the first time, not so well the second time, less well the third time, and so I have to take more and more and more of it, and I start experiencing the side effects of that product. And the side effects are the things that knock us dead, literally and figuratively. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that lead to all of the problems that we talk about, because it's, it's not the first time users who get into trouble with any but a small number of the drugs that are out there. The marijuana advocates are fond of telling us marijuana never killed anybody. Well, not instantaneously, no. But by that notion, smoking never killed anybody. But I think we would all have some argument with that statement, right? Because the argument is not about what happens instantaneously. It's not the sudden death that cocaine can cause. It's not the overdose by shooting too much heroin. That's not what we see with marijuana. It's not what we see with smoking. Interestingly, it is what we see with alcohol, right? Every mm -hmm. September, there are a group of college students who go out and drink too much and die. 
and yet that drug's still available. And that argument is one of the arguments, as Kevin said, that we hear. All right, so it takes these three things to make an addict. It takes the genes, it takes the environment, and it takes the availability, a culture that promotes the use, that accepts the use, and that in fact encourages the use. What's everybody supposed to do when they turn 21? Right? It's what they're supposed to do by their peers. That's the expectation. Right? Why do we have things in this country that are called happy hour? And can you imagine a more absurd name? How many people have you seen coming out of happy hour at the end of the evening who look happy? Right? And yet, that's the term that we use. We watch advertising on TV. People look incredibly happy, and they end up with, with attractive, beautiful people. Right? That's what's promoted. That's the relationships we're taught about. Okay. What else are we taught about? Well, let's look at the 1964 Surgeon General Report. Now, back before the Surgeon General Report, cigarettes were promoted and promoted for health purposes. Doctors promoted the use of smoking to relax patients who were anxious. Mm -hmm. All those people who smoked back in the 20s and 30s and 40s, right? We, remember, we sent, on the GI Bill, we sent all the um, World War II participants cigarettes in their rations. It was part of the rations that they would all get. It was encouraged that people smoke. It was expected that they would smoke. And we didn't see the fallout because smoking never killed anybody, not right away. Yeah. Right? The fallout came decades and decades later. And what we've seen over the past few decades is gradual and significant improvement in that. When I was in med school just 25 years ago, smoking was allowed in the hospital. And you would walk from room to room and the patients would be smoking in their room. If they were on oxygen, they'd take off the oxygen mask, they'd smoke, and then they'd put the oxygen back on. And no one ever gave it a second thought. The chairman of the board at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York smoked during board meetings. Now, the hospital had gone so far as to make it so that there were no ashtrays. So during the board meetings, there were no ashtrays. So he used a paper cup and then lined the cigarettes up as he finished them on the table standing up on their filter. So that by the end of the board meeting, there was a little row of, of cigarettes there in front of the board chairman at Mount Sinai. This wasn't, you know, 1940, this was 1988, right? People were still smoking on airplanes. You couldn't go into an airline terminal without smelling smoke. You couldn't go into an office building without smelling smoke. So things have changed enormously. We've made fantastic progress, and yet more than five people, million people per year die as a result of smoking from what happened before. CDC stated in 2010, the use of tobacco is the primary cause of death worldwide. It's amazing, right? We have this product on the market that is the leading cause of morbidity and mortality, readily available for sale in a country that has spent the past 10, 20 years, however many you want, talking about the cost of health care. Right? How much effort did we put on Obamacare when all we needed to do was ban tobacco? <laughs> that was it. That alone would get rid of all of the health care costs that Obamacare can only hope to touch upon. And yet, no one brought that up. That wasn't even a consideration. So this third part of what makes an addict is something in this country we're still not ready to talk about because this country loves drugs. It's all about the drug. What will make an individual feel better for a short period of time? And now there's this chance that there's another drug that they can get and they're chomping at the bit. And that's what we're dealing with. All right, let's one more look at this. Again, past history. This was an advertisement, right? This was an advertisement. Not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels, right? And there's the doctor wearing his white coat. So 
these were the kind of promotions that we're about to see again. Not one death due to marijuana. Right? They won't put it that way because the word death is there. But they'll talk about other ways of promotion. All right. So keep in mind marijuana is a plant just like tobacco, just like the coca plant, just like the poppy. Right? All these drugs are natural. They're organic. I'd expect to find them in Whole Foods if I didn't think Whole Foods would maybe think twice about that. <laughs> because they're natural products. Like any plant, marijuana contains over 400 products, many more when it's combusted. So when we talk about the drug, we're talking about something very different than when we talk about marijuana, which isn't a drug, it is a plant like tobacco. Right, so it's important to sort of separate the two out. As a physician, if you have a headache, I don't tell you to go out and find a willow tree and eat the bark. <laughs> and yet, in the bark of the willow tree are salicylates, the major product in aspirin. I might tell you to have an aspirin, but I would not tell you to eat the willow bark. And the reason I would tell you that eating the willow bark is probably not a good idea is that there are other components in the willow bark besides salicylates. And I'm concerned, not knowing anything about these other products, maybe one of them would be dangerous. Maybe one of them would cause you pain, morbidity, or death, mortality. And I'd rather you not go there. I'd rather study the willow bark and determine that the salicylates can be synthesized out and made into a product that has a reasonable morbidity and mortality curve. Aspirin. Aspirin never killed anybody. Oh, wait, it can if you take too much of it, mm -hmm. right? So the drugs that we have available as appropriately synthesized products with a reasonable morbidity and mortality rate aren't out there because they're not dangerous. They're out there because the risk ratio is reasonable. They have greater benefit than they do deficits. Right? So we prescribe those drugs. Well, there may well be products in marijuana that are useful. There are a number of studies, not very good ones really, but there are a number of studies out there demonstrating some potential value to cannabinoids and to some of the other components of marijuana. It's quite reasonable that we look into it and find out, do they really have improvements of morbidity and mortality, useful value that um, offsets any negative result of use of the product. Okay, now over the past 35 years, there have been fewer than 20 small trials, so we need to do more research. So the AMA looked at this back in 2009, and they came up with a number of policies. First, they said, there has not yet been adequate study. This all leads me to my usual statement, which I've been quoted on many times, I'll say it again, there is no such thing as medical marijuana. Thank you. Any more than there is such a thing as medical willow bark. <laughs> All right? That doesn't mean there aren't components of willow bark that we can use. And I'm not up here saying there are no components of marijuana that can be used. But right now, there ain't no such thing as medical marijuana. The term should go away. It came from the industry that is promoting the use of marijuana for its own purposes. We already heard something about that. Medicalizing it was the camel's nose under the tent. It was the way of getting the public to think that there is some value in this herb when no such value has yet been demonstrated. So I don't use the term. Neither does the AMA. So by the way, there's not a single guideline or a single white paper out there to tell physicians how marijuana should be recommended or prescribed. In fact, all of them say it should not be recommended or prescribed. The only places that other information is coming from is from the state legislatures. Yeah. And we know how many physicians there are and how many scientists there are in our state legislatures. <laughs> so given that that information is coming from those sources, when we look at physicians who are responsible for the recommendations as to you should go ahead and use marijuana, 
And when we find, as we have in Rhode Island, that the average recommendation goes to a 30-year-old male in good health with a history of addictive disease, I say that these docs should have the book thrown at them. Because they're not, they're not following appropriate medical guidelines in any way whatsoever. OK, AMA. Adequate and well-controlled studies of marijuana and related cannabinoids should be conducted. Great. We all agree research needs to be done. They noted that the Schedule I DEA listing causes difficulties with research. Schedule I basically means that a drug has no medical value and therefore it can't be researched very easily. And yet, Schedule II means that a drug does have medical value and should be used cautiously and with appropriate precautions. Well, neither one is true for marijuana. We don't know that it has no medical value. And we don't know, and we do know that it's not an appropriate medicine at this stage. And yet there's no DEA schedule between the two. There's no 1A. What the AMA has said here is Schedule 1 doesn't really work for it. But they're not saying it should go to Schedule 2. Right. You will hear advocates from time to time argue that this recommendation means the AMA wants it to go to Schedule 2. That's not the case. That's not what they said. The AMA urged the NIH to implement appropriate research protocols, including availability of study-grade marijuana. Study-grade marijuana means, to the AMA, marijuana comparable to that marijuana that's readily available. It doesn't do any good if the marijuana being studied is government-grown 1972-era marijuana. <laughs> the marijuana that needs to be studied is the kind of marijuana that's available currently on the street and in the dispensaries in various states. That marijuana needs to be studied. Discussion of marijuana by the physician should not subject the physician or patient to criminal sanctions. Discussion shouldn't, right? Recommendation might be crossing the line. Discussion shouldn't. Anyone should be allowed to discuss it. The American Society of Addiction Medicine basically came out with very similar recommendations in 2010. Marijuana must have the same standards that are applicable to any prescription medication. Clinicians shouldn't provide access unless FDA approval is there for some product, as it is, by the way, for Marinol. Right? There are drugs out there with concentrated THC. The patients who are out there and the individuals out there advocate, advocating for smoked marijuana don't like Marinol, <laughs> interestingly enough. And they don't like it for a variety of reasons, among which is they can't smoke it. <laughs> Smoking's inherently unsafe, says the American Society of Addiction Medicine, and they discourage state interference in the federal medication approval process. They also rejected the state legislative process as a means for which individuals without appropriate qualifications make determinations about medicine. Finally, physicians ignoring number two. This was number two, clinicians shouldn't provide patient access to marijuana. Clinicians who are just going to ignore that should have a true patient-physician relationship and conduct themselves accordingly. That means they should have a medical chart, they should have a full history, they should have all the information necessary in order to make whatever recommendation they're going to make. It also means that they need to make recommendations, as in number eight, regarding the composition and dose. Now, I run into this in Social Security court all the time. Somebody comes in claiming disability due to their anxiety and depression, and it turns out, as we look over their chart, that they are always positive for marijuana. Well, yes, they hop up in court before the administrative law judge. I have my marijuana card. And so we look in the medical record, and I say, Your Honor, it doesn't appear that there's any place in the record where the physician has indicated the dose of marijuana that the claimant should have or the frequency with which he should have it. Given that, there's no medication that's been prescribed, and therefore the marijuana is being used illicitly from a federal perspective, and therefore they don't get disability. That's the end of that, unless I'm not there. If I'm not there, many of the judges tend to say, well, he's using marijuana at the recommendation of a prescriber, and therefore that's no longer material to a finding of disability. 
and therefore will pay the case. And I can't tell you how many people are now receiving Social Security disability benefits because they smoke marijuana at the recommendation of a physician. But I can tell you it's a lot more now than it was a couple of years ago. So when we think about the costs, and Kevin went through some of that, that one to 10 ratio, what's not factored in there are the costs due to benefits that are actually paid to individuals who wouldn't otherwise need benefits. What's not factored in there are the mortality and lost productivity secondary to the substance use, right? So we've got some revenue, that's the one. We've got some expense, that's for the morbidity. That's the 10. But what's probably closer to 100 on the expense side is the fact that we've lost the functional productivity of individuals who otherwise would have lived decades longer and been more contributory to society. That's an enormous weight all the way on the other side of the coin that we are about to add to with marijuana. Okay. ASAM made more recommendations in 2012. First is that physicians should lead efforts to oppose legislative initiatives. This is because we saw the writing on the wall and said things can't keep going in the direction they're going. All physicians should incorporate screening and treatment for risky substance use into their routine. Interesting that risky substance use. The risk is really always there because the individuals who have the genes and the environmental trigger don't know who they are until they try the drug, right? So if they don't know who they are, any substance use is risky. Um, inform the public that the marijuana today is of far higher potency. This is what we've already gone through. Monitor addiction treatment uh, um, uh, to those with marijuana use disorders. Study drug driving. We talked about that a little bit. Promote systems such as drug courts. The American Psychiatric Association really said the same thing. By sanctioning patients' consumption, psychiatrists might contribute to the adverse community impact of the culture surrounding marijuana dispensaries, including criminal behavior. So they are not sanctioning patients' consumption. Um, and oops, I went the wrong way. There we are. All right, bottom line, no such thing as medical marijuana. There might indeed be components of marijuana that have potential medical value. We can synthesize, we can purify, we can characterize, and we'll know whether that's true. And by the way, when I've said that before, people have made mention, well, he's a physician. He's on the side of big pharma. He just wants the pharmaceutical industry to make money off of a product that really doesn't need to bring money to big pharma. Instead, it should bring money to other big companies like big tobacco. <laughs> I don't quite get that argument. So once we determine whether or not the pharmaceutical companies come up with a solution to this, if indeed there is a product out there that has the value, and remember one last point about that, we not only have to demonstrate that a component of marijuana has potential value, but we have to demonstrate that that potential value is greater than the value that is available from another medicine. So it's not just that it reduces nausea or it improves intraocular pressure or it reduces perception of pain, but that it does those things better and with less risk than other readily available medications. So that needs to be demonstrated too. And that's the part that seems to be missing out there. Because if it were just the fact that it needs to have some supposed benefit, okay, maybe we'll pass that hurdle pretty quickly. But there's much more that a medicine needs to go through in order to be approved. All right, until then, the mere fact that people don't associate illnesses with their use of a substance doesn't in and of itself substantiate its safety because for many decades there, people didn't associate emphysema, heart disease, and so forth with the smoking that they had been doing all their lives, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? That association is very difficult to make compared to the association of something that happens immediately as with a drug like cocaine. Mm -hmm. So all of these things are things to keep in mind. I'll be available for most of the day if you have any questions. Thanks so much.
Okay, we're going to take a little break. We're uh, just a tiny bit, 10 minutes behind. Um, if you guys could be back here by 10.45, 15 minutes. Kevin's going to be signing his marijuana, uh, excuse me, reefer sanity book out to the left. And please come back because we have a tremendous amount of more really great information for you guys. Thanks. And thanks so far, Dr. Gitlow. Thank you, great Kevin. Job. Thank you. Okay, I think we're going to start in a one minute. If, if people can find their seats. And I just want to say in the break, I was asked by a number of people about the slides. So how many of you have downloaded the Katka app? Okay, these are definitely going to be on the Katka app, as are the slides from yesterday afternoon's presentation. If you don't have the Katka app, all of this is going to be available on Katka's website on the part of it for the mid-year. Everything will be available so that you can download it, print it out, and do whatever you want. And if it's okay with you, Kevin, I would actually like to introduce David oh, Jernigan. And Why don't you just David Jernigan, how many of you have heard David Jernigan speak, know of David Jernigan from all of his brilliant work on alcohol advertising and alcohol policy. He's amazing. David is one of my closest friends in Washington. We do a tremendous amount of advocacy together. Can I say that? The disclaimer is he's not, he's doing it on his own time. <laughs> but the really interesting thing is here, we've had conversations for four or five years about getting him involved in this marijuana issue. And until this was reframed by Kevin to be about big tobacco and big alcohol, and that big marijuana is going to be the same type of an industry targeting kids, being regressive, advertising. David wasn't that interested in getting involved. <laughs> but he's involved now because of the connecting the dots of a lot of the work that Kevin and Patrick Kennedy and others have done to really tie this issue to big tobacco. Big marijuana is the problem, and I'm turning it over to one of the most brilliant people in this field, David Jernigan. And now I want to quote Jimmy Carter, who when I heard him in Atlanta this year said, that's the best introduction I've had recently. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm here to run you through the horror story of where I spend most of my time, uh, alcohol and what could happen. These are some lessons. We're going to speed read through these. Alcohol, number one cause of death and disability of 15 to 24 year olds in every region of the world except the Eastern Mediterranean. I don't think we're going to turn all the 15 and 24 year olds in the world into Muslims. So. <laughs> Uh, third leading actual cause of death in the U.S., 80,000 deaths a year, leading drug problem among young people. Alcohol use is related to more than 200 disease categories. Alcohol is clearly not an ordinary commodity. This is lesson one. Marijuana is not an ordinary commodity. The market is set up for ordinary commodities. The market will not regulate marijuana in a way that's healthy for young people. We'll need research to demonstrate over and over and over again that marijuana is not an ordinary commodity, and in particular, to be able to count up, show, demonstrate the toll of marijuana use on young people, and a marijuana control system needs to be carefully planned and maintained. We cannot let this product out on an open market. It's not ordinary. Little history lesson, uh, prohibition generally seen as a huge failure in this country. Big success public health-wise. Mm -hmm. uh, the alcoholism rate, death rate, the cirrhosis death trend, uh, consumption fell flew through the floor uh, and then started coming back up uh, at repeal in 1932. Another little known fact about pro prohibition uh, is, man, did it mess up the tax collection system in the US. Prior to prohibition, alcohol taxes were bringing in uh, about $208 million, that's $4.5 billion in 2010 dollars. It was about 31% of federal revenues were coming from alcohol prior to prohibition. We ban alcohol, federal government loses those uh, revenues, they massively increase the income tax in order to pick up the slack. So the failure of prohibition, it was a big failure for federal revenues. 
Post-prohibition, the federal government devolved authority to the states and kept alcohol policy in the Treasury Department. Lesson two, don't let governments get high on the revenues. The best place for marijuana regulation is not the Treasury Department. It's not the fiscal department. Marijuana needs to be regulated by medical and public health authorities. The tax income from marijuana needs to be secondary and incidental and not central to the regulation of marijuana. Just a footnote, after the repeal of prohibition, alcohol regulation put in Treasury, 1934, alcohol taxes are back to 9.5% of federal revenues. The key elements of the U.S. alcohol control system, it rests on four principles. High taxes controlling economic availability, producer self-restraint in marketing, controlling social and psychological availability, license or monopoly systems of distribution at the state level, controlling physical availability, and local control at state and local, and even in the great city of Chicago, you can vote your precinct dry in Chicago. So lesson three, build a marijuana control system that are based on what the World Health Organization in terms of alcohol has termed the three best buys of prevention. Control economic availability, control social and psychological availability, and control physical availability. So let's talk a little bit about taxes and economic availability. In this respect, alcohol is an ordinary commodity. Duh, people increase their drinking when prices are lower and decrease their consumption when prices go up and adolescents and problem drinkers are not an exception to the rule. So increased alcoholic beverage taxes and prices are related to reductions in alcohol-related problems. My favorite, you raise the tax, kids' gonorrhea rates go down. What does that tell you? <laughs> Implementation <laughs> failure. Federal alcohol taxes, state as well, but federal alcohol taxes have miserably failed to keep up with inflation. This is a nice little curve. It just shows you falling, 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 falling. This is the real value of the alcohol tax. At this point, in terms of federal revenues, alcohol taxes are budget dust. They are such a small percentage of federal revenues at this point, and it's even worse at the state level. This is my own state. I could only get uh, data back to 1977 when we were a massive 0.7% of state tax revenues. Um, by 2006, we were uh, barely 0.1% of state revenues. This is why my friend Nicole Holt calls alcohol taxes a poorly performing revenue source. It's a nice frame. Uh, so the result, off-premise, beer's cheaper than water, orange juice, milk, and soda. This is one of my favorite little exercises that we do. Uh, we've lost the slides. Yeah, we've lost the slides on the screens. I don't know where our AV people are. Right here. Up again? Awesome. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> All right. Oh, hi. So I love uh, sending kids, sending research assistants, whatever, into the local corner store and having them buy the cheapest forms of liquor, liquid in the corner store. Predictably, per ounce, beer is going to be the cheapest. This is a bad message to kids. On-premise, alcohol is widely discounted, happy hours, lady nights, and so on. Because the taxes don't keep up with inflation, every year alcohol becomes more economically available. Every year this industry gets an automatic tax cut. The rest of us don't, that's not fair. Moving on, implementation failure in terms of social and psychological availability. Well, alcohol advertising in the US is self-regulated. We've got the fox building the chicken coop, not just minding it. <laughs> alcohol is a $1 trillion a year industry globally. It's heavily concentrated among a few large companies. Alcohol companies spend about $4 billion a year on marketing in the US. They claim advertising has no relationship to consumption. Guess they're just wasting all that money. They claim self-regulation works because there are so few complaints. Who'd want to complain? The Beer Institute's Code Review Board has never found a beer ad in violation of their code. Isn't that remarkable? <laughs> so lesson four, control the size and power of the industry. In the US, two beer companies control 80% of the beer industry. Spirits is also highly concentrated. This concentration allows what economists call oligopoly profit-taking. 
And this profit taking has two key outcomes. The alcohol companies can afford to spend very heavily on marketing, which then keeps new players from being able to compete with the existing big ones, which then preserves the oligopoly and permits them to keep taking the profits. And they can afford to spend heavily on lobbying. In fact, alcohol companies spent $20 million on lobbying at the federal level in 2010 alone. They have one lobbyist for every two members of Congress. That's a really good teacher to student ratio. <laughs> they also gave $150 million to state political campaigns from 2001 to 2010. In 2012, so far, $5 million in federal contributions by beer and wine alone. Let's talk about marketing. So in the beginning, there was the Alcopop. Smirnoff Ice, don't you love it? All about developing brand loyalty at an early age. And you know, I don't make these up. Diageo rolled out Smirnoff Ice in the US market. It suddenly put the once stodgy name on the lips of millions of Echo Boomers' tongues. Well, who were the Echo Boomers in 2003? Americans born 1980 to 1995. So they were between eight and 23 years old when the industry was saying these things. The beauty of this category is it brings in new drinkers, people who really don't like the taste of beer. Gee, who is that? Females and, of course, 85% uh, of people in the U.S. started drinking before they were 21. Who are the new drinkers? Young people. Every day in this country, 4,500 young people under the age of 16 start drinking. That is, they have their first full drink of alcohol beyond a sip. Alcohol pops, not surprisingly, most popular with the youngest drinkers and most popular with females in every age group. And this is the current version of their marketing, a Dr. Seuss quote. <laughs> Why fit in when you were born to stand out? Well, that's clearly targeting women in their early 30s, right? <laughs> Okay, self-regulation, I'll let you be the focus group. The Distilled Spirits Council, alcohol advertising and marketing materials should not contain any lewd or indecent images or language. What do you think? Is this a code violation? Let's see a show of hands. It's not hard to do this. It's supposed to use models that are a minimum of 25 years old. If you can read the slide, Amanda's got age question mark. Jessica's got age 21. Focus group, code violation? See a show of hands? So not hard to tell. Oh, they're not supposed to use Santa Claus. <laughs> These are brand uploaded photos on the uh, Captain Morgan Facebook page. I won't even make you vote. Uh, a little few more things to just welcome to my world. Natural vodka, natural beer, because you can't almost be a virgin. Uh, vodka from soy, it's gluten free. It's so good for you. It's organic, it's natural. Binge in a can, this is a 23 and a half an hour. A 23 and a half ounce can of 12% uh, alcohol, the equivalent of four to five beers in a single can sold in a single serving, but it's natural. And furthermore, it has natural Brazilian healing powers. <laughs> a wild Brazilian berry, uva, is part of the grape family and has been revered for centuries for its mystical healing powers. <laughs> They're not allowed by federal law to make health claims for the alcohol, so they make it for the flavor. Beer, it's your next personal trainer. It has antioxidants. <laughs> Never mind that it causes cancer. It has oxidant, antioxidants. It makes you smart. It makes you fast. Yeah, I want to run a marathon on Michelob Ultra. <laughs> it's a diet drink. Only 95 calories, the lightest beer in the world, and it advertises on the Weight Watchers website. Get ready for marijuana as a weight control aid. <laughs> I don't make this up, I just collect it. Even the can is slim. No carbs, no carbs, no question. All right, what does this have to do with young people? A whole lot. We have more than 14 longitudinal studies, never mind the experimental literature that it's also growing. Followed groups of young people over time, the more exposed they are to alcohol marketing, the more like they are to drink, or if they were already drinking, to drink more. Over and over again, what we have found is that the industry violates its own codes with impunity, and kids are exposed to more advertising per person than adults. Magazines, 10% more exposure to beer ads, 16% more exposure to alcohol pops ads. Radio, 32% of the ads on programming, mean, kids were more likely to be listening to per person than adults. TV, about one out of five ads on programs that were more likely to be watched by kids per capita than adults. And on TV, youth exposure is growing faster than that of any age group. Just wait until you have marijuana ads on television. 
This is all a few brands, it's a few bad actors. Again, there's a lot of the industry that could care less about kids, but there are some key, grant, key brands that are responsible for the bulk of youth exposure. Alcohol use is branded. If you do studies of alcohol advertising and you look at the entire market, you won't see much of effect because so many of the brands are not going after the kids, but some of them really do. So we went to the kids. We asked the kids for the first time ever, what are you actually drinking? And surprise, surprise, they're all the heavily advertised brands. Big surprise, they're not the cheapest brands. Kids are not profit maximizers here. They actually are affected by marketing. And this is the first of a whole series of studies that we're doing that you're going to have to do in marijuana as well. I'm sorry, but we're going to trot out so many studies that draw all the lines as clearly as we possibly can. Here's the marketing. Here's the kids' drinking behavior. Duh, there's a relationship. That was a technical term as a researcher. Duh. <laughs> They're all over social media, and uh, we're trying to study that stuff. But again, it doesn't take a rocket scientist just to get onto the branded social media pages, look at the darn pictures. How many of you think there are people in these pictures who are under age 21? OK, let's raise those hands up high. OK, so like I said, it doesn't take a rocket scientist or even a public health researcher. So the implementation failure in terms of social and psychological availability Product development is regulated by the Treasury Department. See lesson two. Do not put the regulatory authority in the fiscal department. They know nothing about public health, and they don't really care. Alcohol marketing abounds. Advertisers police themselves. The codes are vague. Enforcement is rare. So lesson five, ban the marketing. It's <laughs> just ban it. There's plenty of reason. There's a strong First Amendment dis defense under Central Hudson that could be made. There's precedent. Marketing of medicines is much more tightly regulated. Once the madmen get a hold of marijuana, the floodgates will open and the tide will be difficult to turn. So get out now while you can. <laughs> Moving on to physical availability. The monopoly states. Washington State just lost their liquor monopoly uh, overnight. Thousands of new outlets for alcohol in Washington State. They passed a big tax increase at the same time. It's going to muddy the effects water somewhat. Uh, but you can see what's going on. The main interest of the state in alcohol is let's not lose the revenue that we're getting from it. But let's also just not think about the public health consequences. Pennsylvania, we just very, very closely uh, won a tight debate uh, over privatization in Pennsylvania. I ducked out earlier because a reporter from the Philly Daily News. This is still a story uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, so lesson six, create and safeguard state-run monopolies of distribution, production, wholesale, and retail, and put them under control of the health authorities. See lesson two. Implementation failure, the license states. I come from a license state, the state of Maryland. Uh, their control is devolved to local licensing boards appointed by the government. An audit of our liquor board was just done. It was so amazing. We finally got an audit. And the Baltimore Sun editorialized, liquor boards are traditional dumping grounds for political patronage, and there are all sorts of opportunities for mischief and favoritism. But Baltimore's liquor board exists on a level of incompetence that is likely unparalleled in Maryland. <laughs> It was an amazing audit. Uh, suddenly, the head of the liquor board decided it was time to retire. He was gone in two weeks. The audit found that they failed to document that new outlets were at least 300 feet from schools or churches. They had prematurely, the, the auditors filed test complaints, filed 311 test complaints, and the inspectors prematurely closed them, that is, closed without doing any investigation, uh, half of them. Uh, inspections were all over the place, and so on. What we know from alcohol research, and again, this is a big body of literature, when you increase the number of alcohol outlets, you increase violence, crime, sexually transmitted infections, noise, injuries, property damage, and so on. We've got this evidence from city after city. This isn't one study. This is lots of studies at this point. It is an outrage. These studies cluster in minority communities. Blacks face higher density than whites. Minorities in lower income neighborhoods have more liquor stores. Minority youth have more liquor stores in their neighborhoods. So lesson seven, 
structure in local control over marijuana availabil availability. What we found in alcohol is the industry is weakest at the most local level. You're going to need multiple avenues of control. In alcohol, we use both licen licensing and we use planning and zoning. This is where we can do small d democracy. It's much more effective if we can get the greatest amount of local control possible. And again, we love Chicago because they can vote dry by precinct. Lesson eight. Again, you're going to need research studies. You're going to need more research studies than I want to do. Um, but we're going to have to fund robust policy research. Most of the research money in alcohol goes to addiction research, goes to biochemical research, goes to find that, finding that genetic or biological X factor that if we could produce a drug for it, we'd block addiction. And I'm sorry, I care about addiction, but 75% of binge drinkers are never going to qualify for a definition, for a diagnosis of an alcohol use disorder. They're just not. They're not going to show up in a doctor's office. We got to do prevention. We got to fund prevention, and we got to fund policy studies. We got to fund policy studies that will show effectiveness, test effectiveness, and defend the controls that are in place. So at the end of the day, the last thing I want to talk about, I think, is organizing. Uh, I love this slide, you know, this is just an inspiration from social movements uh, in all sorts of areas, not just public health, but we've got to support and build a social and popular movement for control, and frankly, that's why I'm happy to be supporting Sam, that's why I'm happy to be talking to you today, because we absolutely need you. The industry has money, we have to have numbers. The biggest gains in alcohol worldwide have come through social movements. Just folks need opportunities to weigh in, to have voices at the table about the effects of all the experiments that are being tried now around marijuana, just as it's been critical for us to train up and support the folks at the local level on alcohol. Years and years ago, one of the alcohol industry executives said, our industry is being pecked to death by ducks. Ducks, thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> So to summarize, marijuana is not an ordinary commodity. Don't let governments get drunk on their revenues. Build a control system based on the three best buys. Control the size and power of the industry. Ban the marketing. Create and safeguard state-run monopolies. Structure in local control of marijuana availability. Fund a robust policy research portfolio on the marijuana expenses, experiments, and support a social and popular movement for marijuana control. Thank you very much. I hope you don't end up where we are on alcohol. <laughs> No, you're excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jernigan, for being just an amazing addition to our group. Just to connect the dots a little bit for us right now, which was, which was what you did, when we look at what's happening in Colorado and Washington, but also around, around the country, we're seeing some, I think, successes and failures based on the lessons already. So right now, the ability for at least initially banning advertising has been very, very difficult because the lobby is already organized and they have actually, Colorado tried to ban advertising and they had a lawsuit the next day, the judge stayed that um, and now the advertising is back. Um, doesn't mean the fight's done, it means it's an uphill battle, which of course we know, but the fight is not done. Where we've had some successes, yesterday the second largest city in Colorado has banned recreational marijuana dispensaries. That's huge. And the, and, the Cal, and the California Supreme Court two months ago said that cities, after 15 years, can ban dispensaries. So L.A. went from 1,200 to under 100. That, that's real. I mean, is it to zero? No, it's not ideal. But 1,200 to 100, we'll take it. I mean, that's, that's lives saved and quality of life increased. But we can only do this by, by working together with advocacy and, and, frankly, with legislative action. And the other thing that really resonated with me about what, what David was saying was about the research that we're funding. I am the number one proponent of the fact that we need to keep doing basic research with, with, with drug addiction to learn about changes to the brain. The brain scans are not just pretty pictures. They're important to teaching us about all sorts of exciting things related to vaccines and treatment, et cetera. But as David said, we have to do the policy studies. We have to do the policy research. We're happy that NIDA now is funding policy research for medical marijuana to look at that, but we can't wait 15 to 20 years now 
for the next wave with recreational. Are you with me or not? We need to, to be able to document this. Our SAM affiliate in Washington is the watchdog group now looking at what the effects are and documenting every single one of these things that's happening, documenting the fact that they are seeing changes in attitudes. And we have to be able to do that and to, to, to working also with our youth to be able to do that. So I, I would just say, I, you know, what, what you said resonated a lot because it, it shows the potential. It kind of shows a bit of a horror story as well um, in terms of where the alcohol industry is. Um, but it also shows that there's a lot of things we can actually do to push back, mm -hmm. but it's not going to come from the top. It is going to come from local communities. So with that, I think it's a wonderful segue to segue to somebody that um, is, is just, you know, has been a mentor to me who's been somebody that has been out there for two decades talking about policy and talking about policy to the right people. And like I said, um, you know, I didn't see this more in focus than when I was at ONDCP. Um, and and uh, working in the federal government, how Sue Thaw advocates for all of you on your behalf. So we're just so lucky to have her as a huge inspiration for us in the policy world dealing with marijuana. So with that, I'd like to introduce Sue, and there you go. Okay. I'm going to use this. All right. Good after morning. No. <laughs> No, there's a lot of information. I think this session is amazing. So a lot of you, how many of you heard me speak yesterday afternoon? Okay, a lot of you. So what I want to say is what I've done here is taken a lot of those same messages and translated them into pictures. So we're sort of going from the blah blah to a couple of messages to now we're going to actually put the messages into visual pictures that all of you can actually use on Facebook, social media, with kids, with community groups, because a lot of people have sort of lost their ability to, uh, to listen for a long time, but pictures are worth a thousand words. So, how many of you originally felt like this when you were dealing with uh, medical marijuana, marijuana? Like, yeah, right, it's like, I think if I just put my head in the sand, this will all pass by and nothing bad will happen, and how's that worked for us? Not very well. That's why we have like this set up for 600 people today, because we've all gotten our heads sort of out of the sand and realized, oh my God, we really have to deal with this issue. It's not going away. It's getting worse. But then some of us actually start feeling like this. Okay, my head's out of the sand, but uh, what the hell am I supposed to do about this? <laughs> okay. And then those of us doing something about it sort of feel like this, right? <laughs> Yeah, I'm out here, where's everybody else? Oh my God, they're sort of either not caring or they're buying the crap on the other side of it. So what we need to do is what we always do, folks. We need to get the doctors, the lawyers, and the Indian chiefs who we already have at the table, on our side, mobilized. I don't know where Stu Gitlow is, but he's absolutely brilliant, and we need all of his members and ASAM in your local communities to be part of our coalitions and to be saying the same thing that he said. Okay. And I just want to tell you, too, this entire session, General Dean very generously has paid to have it filmed. So we are going to have all of the video to be turned into YouTube videos and sound bites and everything else that everybody can use. Really important. So. What do we need to do? We know what we need to do. We need to get to elected officials, state medical societies, communities of color and immigrants, business leaders, teachers and school boards, faith leaders, law enforcement, researchers and economists, and we need to get to them first, right? We have them at the table, so we need to use our messages to get them on our side quickly before other people co-opt them about the crap that the other side is selling. It is snake oil, we all know that, okay? And we also need to connect the dots for everybody. Uh, I want to call this giving people the sort of aha, I got it messages, so that it's boiled down to meeting people where they are with the messages that are going to resonate for them and segmenting the messages so that we're not giving them all of it, we're giving them what they most are going to care about. So, frames win debates. And our whole job is to figure out how medical marijuana and legalization directly affect the people that we're trying to win over to our side. So we need to reframe the issues in ways that directly appeal to regular people. 
As you've seen, the other side has done this brilliantly. And those of you who have heard me speak before know, I have a mother who was diagnosed with cancer. She had never smoked a cigarette in her life. She didn't drink alcohol. She rarely took an aspirin. And yet, the first thing out of her mouth when she found out she needed chemo was asking the oncologist if she could get marijuana. OK, that's when I realized that we were doing a pretty bad job framing this, because the doctor was great, and he said, it's not medicine, absolutely. If you've never been high, you'd hate it. That's not what this whole thing is even about. But it was really hit close to me that I hadn't done a very good job with my own family on framing this or getting the messages out in English. So how do we frame the messages to win back the public? We need to change the frame from negative to positive from being the scolds to actually turning this around so that you know if you want positive outcomes for kids and communities, you actually need to be with us, OK? From the old to the new, we need youth involved. We need new messages. Someone came up to me at the break and said exactly that. Kids are brilliant at uh, framing messages for other kids. And we really need to sort of change the messengers. It can't all be old white people up here, wrong messengers sometimes. <laughs> Um, oh, excuse me, and one young white person up here. No, I'm, okay. <laughs> and we've got to go from complicated to simple. And when I said to my staff, can you find a picture of a Rube Goldberg thing, they didn't know what I was talking about, but there is a picture of the Rube Goldberg scheme there. Um, yeah. So those of you who heard me speak yesterday, a lot of these messages are the same, but they've now sort of been boiled down. So if you care about jobs and profits, you need to care about marijuana use and the fact that as attitudes change, use is going to skyrocket. Why? Because we know on the research, two independent peer-reviewed studies have concluded states with medical marijuana programs have increased marijuana use rates not seen in other states. According to a RAND study, legalization is going to cause the price of marijuana to fall and its use to rise. We know this. This is science-based. This is economics. We know this. So this actually hurts employers because people who use marijuana and other drugs are 10 times more likely to miss work. They're 3.6 times more likely to be involved in an on-the-job accident, and I hope you can see We've put pictures to all these. Here's the construction guy that basically has had something fall on his knee. It hurts employers because people who use drugs are five times more likely to file a work in, workman's compensation claim. And every time they do, the insurance rates for these businesses go up. This costs business money. And they need to care about this. And it hurts employers because regular users can't pass drug tests, and it hurts employability. This also hurts people who are looking for jobs who need to be aware of the fact that really hard to get a job if you can't pass a pre-employment drug test. So what's the takeaway message for employers? Increased marijuana use is bad for business. Really simple message. OK. So the new frame is if you care about academic achievement, and I think everybody does, you really need to care about marijuana use. Why? And the data here is the same. The research hasn't changed from yesterday. So the adolescent brain is especially susceptible to marijuana use. That's a fact. We know that. So when kids use, they have a greater chance of addiction since their brains are being primed. So we know that. One in six kids who uses marijuana will become addicted to it. I don't think we can afford that. That's a lot of kids. OK. I went through this yesterday, marijuana use. We have a definitive NIDA study. Decreases IQ by eight points if you're an early persistent user. So it drops someone from average of 100 to 92. It's a problem. So I love this picture. You got the kid who's never used marijuana, like, OK, I get it. And the other kid is sort of looking around with their reduced IQ rate, not quite looking at the book, not quite getting it. So. This is NIDA's little logo of the marijuana use and the arrow from the I for IQ going down. So what are the facts? A more student uses, or the more a student uses marijuana, the lower their grade point average, and the more likely they're going to drop out of school. How many people think that people in your community care about school graduation rates? OK, there is a direct correlation. This is cited from Monitoring the Future from Johnson and O'Malley. 
more you use it, more likely you are to be dropping out of school, hanging around on a street corner. Is that what anybody thinks you want or people want in your community? No. Okay. Youth with an average grade of D or below were more than four times likely to have used marijuana in the past year than youth with an average of A. So you're going from the kids actively involved in working on chemistry to the kid who's like, I have no idea what's going on in this class, get me out of here. 6.5% of high school seniors smoke marijuana every day, monitoring the future. I asked you yesterday, how many of you are even seeing rates of daily use among 12th graders higher than 6.5%? A lot of you. This is a national average, which means that a lot of places are seeing higher rates. Are these kids employable? No. no, that's right. But that also means that in every high school classroom of 30 kids in America, two kids sitting in the classroom who are still in school, they haven't dropped out, are stoned every single day. That's a problem. It's a problem for society. It's a real problem for teachers. Increased marijuana use is going to result in reduced academic achievement for which teachers and school systems will be blamed, make no mistake. The teachers, the school board, the principals in your town and community need to understand this. This is going to be a disaster and they are going to be blamed for it. So we need to connect the dots for them. And here are the dots. You're going to go from teacher of the year to getting a pink slip because as you're teaching to the standardized tests, if kids are early persistent users, they're losing brain power as you're teaching them and you can't control that and yet your job depends on whether these kids meet the standardized tests. Do you agree that that's true? Okay, well how many think that this is something that we need to get out with more power to teachers, teachers unions? <laughs> and anybody else that actually cares about educational achievement. Okay, this came up yesterday too, but this one is really interesting. So Amelia Aria from the University of Maryland did a very recent study that found that college students with high levels of marijuana use were, this kid's in college, twice as likely as those with minimal or no use to have an enrollment gap in college. So what's an enrollment gap? It means you're gonna either drop out or not graduate on time. Now, how many of you think college is very expensive? It's very expensive, right? The average cost of college in four years is about 90,000. Average cost of college in five years is 111,000. Average cost, if it takes you six years to get out, is 133,000. How many people think the parents actually care about if they're sending their kids to school that it's this expensive that they don't either drop out, have an enrollment gap, or take seven years to get out of college because they're smoking dope all the time and they can't keep up a full-time schedule? Well, you know what? I care about that. So the message here is marijuana will hurt your child's chances of academic success because it could delay or derail their college graduation. And let me tell you, people are saving, they're remortgaging their houses to send their kids to college. How many people are seeing that in your community? Yeah, hello. Well, this is a family financial crisis and issue as it is. I don't think people understand this and I don't think we can afford it. So here's the visual. Four years of college, you're getting out, the degree person in their cap and gown, a lot of money, but if you're a marijuana smoker, it's going to cost you more money to your parents and you have less of a chance of getting out of college. I don't know, as a parent of one kid who got out and one kid who didn't, I think this is really big stuff. Um, this has been said now a hundred times, so I'm going to run through it really fast, but everybody cares about rising tax rates. Everybody thinks that they're overtaxed regardless of what tax bracket they're in. And this is being sold as a panacea for states and communities going to raise billions of dollars. It's been said by five people already this week, every dollar that we get from alcohol and tobacco taxes costs society ten times in social costs. Does anybody think it's going to be any different from marijuana? Thank you. No. <laughs> Okay, so here you go, total cost of alcohol versus the amount raised by taxes. Same for tobacco, costs society much more than it brings in. So what's the takeaway messages for taxpayers? And I think this is any citizen in a community that pays taxes. This is gonna be a tax drain. 
We know that. This is absolutely not going to be a moneymaker. Now, this is one we added. It's very interesting here. Um, David Jernigan introduced me to a woman who is a brilliant community organizer who works for the environmental field. Um, she does what I do for some of the really big environmental groups. And a couple of studies came out that were really interesting that big marijuana grows in places like California were actually ruining the environment. I mean, here we have everyone going, it's green and it's natural. And yet, the studies are showing that there are massive amounts of fish kills and people using pesticides and other stuff. And I said to her, do you think we can get the environmental community on our side? And she went to them, and of course, they were like, no, not really. We're not interested in getting involved in this. But the, the whole thing is that decon and other sort of um, things that are used to get, not have, you know, parasites and insects eat the marijuana plants, all of that poison is getting into watersheds, and it's basically used to keep rodents away, but it's really polluting water and it's resulting in horrible fish kills. And how many of you live in places where you're seeing things like that? Okay, well, it might not be the traditional environmental groups that you can get on your side, but maybe you can locally. I mean, this is another issue. The people at the Washington level policy thing didn't want to touch it, but you have to drink the water where you live. So maybe somebody will actually care about that. So, you know, you go from this rolling stream to a whole bunch of outdoor grows to you end up with something that looks like the picture at the end, which is a polluted stream and not too much water left because it's all being siphoned off to actually grow the marijuana plants. It's a problem. So takeaway message on the environment. Marijuana grows are bad for the environment. Somebody said in a session yesterday, oh, you know, we're, we're going to try to make these outdoor grows because we know the indoor grows have environmental consequences. We'll wake up, the outdoor grows have environmental consequences as well. Nobody's going to be regulating how this is done because there's not enough money for all the regulators to be running around because we're not going to raise enough money to regulate this right. This is all bullshit. Excuse my language. <laughs> okay. The real Sue thought came out. <laughs> so, if you care about highway safety, you need to care about marijuana use. You've heard this a hundred times. We know based on the research, marijuana impairs driving ability, although the big myth out there is that people drive better when they're like uh, high on marijuana because they're more cautious and they drive slower. It is absolutely not true. We have, I have had Parents of my own children say to me, I would rather my kid smoke, drove stoned than drunk. And my thing is, why would you want your kid to drive impaired at all? Really good question. But marijuana is the most prevalent illegal drug detected in impaired drivers, people who die in car crashes, etc. And so I said this yesterday, but it's really important. Once the dispensaries opened in California, they saw a doubling of the amount of people killed in car accidents due to having smoked marijuana. And they found this at the same time that car crashes in general in the state of California were going down. So the trend for car crashes was going down and those due to marijuana were doubling. Highway safety people, regular parents, people who go to church on Sundays don't want to be driving on the road with more and more impaired drivers. And a lot of people who are smoking marijuana and driving are also drinking as well. So you have a combined effect that makes this really a gigantic problem. So here's the other problem. Perceptions of the dangers that kids have about marijuana in general, but the dangers they have about thinking it's dangerous to drive stoned. According to the Monitoring the Future survey, one in eight high school seniors reported driving after smoking marijuana. One in eight, folks, that's a lot of kids driving around stoned. Um, and so here's, here's the visual for it. Nobody wants to see a car crash like this. Nobody. And yet that's where we're headed if this gets too far out of the barn. So the takeaway message for this one is increased marijuana use is going to lead definitely to increased traffic accidents and fatalities and decreased public safety. We know that. We need to connect the dots for the recovery community. Unfortunately, everybody in our field isn't with us. I think Patrick Kennedy being in recovery and speaking out on this is important. And I want to say to K 
Kevin and I, when we were in Ohio, happened to stay in a hotel, and as we were checking out, it turns out that a group of Narcotics Anonymous people had the next conference, and they were coming in. And they asked what we were doing, and we started talking. And every single one, these are all recovering crack addicts in Ohio, said, oh, I started with weed, and it really scares me that if this becomes more accessible and available, I'm going to relapse, because I'm going to think it's OK to smoke weed, and I'm going to end up back on crack. And Kevin caught a lot of that on video. So we need to do a better job convincing the recovery community that increasing access and availability and reducing the perception of risk is actually bad for recovery. How many of you agree with that? OK, we need to do a better job getting the recovery community involved. Because increased access and availability will threaten recovery, and it will end up that more people will relapse. We all support screening, breach, brief intervention, and referral to treatment and recovery support. We all support that, right? But why would we be investing all these dollars in this and at the same time doing something that's going to make it harder and harder to keep people in recovery? We need to connect the dots for communities of color. This is critical. I don't know how easy it's going to be to read this, but the CSMOT does a, it's, they're a Michigan hospital. They do a children's health survey every year. And last year, obesity and drug abuse tied as the number one problem that people 18 and above that they surveyed said were facing you. So our stuff's up there again, tied for number one. But when you peel back the onion, it was only tied with obesity at 33% because only 28% of white people surveyed thought drug abuse was a really big problem. But 49% of Hispanic adults thought it was by far the biggest problem. And 44% of African Americans thought it was by far the biggest problem. So it only tied with obesity at that point because there were more white people than Hispanic and black people. This is a gigantic problem for people of color. It is their kids that are disproportionately and always have been targeted by advertising. David didn't have the time to go through that, but he can speak to that, and he does a lot. So these people are already really afraid that this is a gigantic issue for their kids. And I think that they definitely should and will be with us. The latest monitor, and the, why are they afraid? Because it's backed up by the data. The latest monitor in the future survey reports in 2011, more eighth and 10th grade Hispanic youth used marijuana, heroin, crack cocaine, ecstasy, methamphetamine, and other illicit drugs annually than African American or white youth. Now you might ask, why is it only 8th and 10th grade Hispanic youth that have such high rates? Because so many of them have dropped out by the 12th grade. They're no longer in the Monitoring the Future survey. Okay, I don't blame Hispanic parents for being concerned. This is a crisis, but we need to get them in our coalitions. Okay, this was said before too. Why are communities of color more vulnerable because they're always targeted. There are eight times as many alcohol outlets in poorer communities of color than upper class white communities. So where does anyone think the dispensaries are going? You think they're going to Chevy Chase, Maryland? No, in DC they're going to uh, Anacostia where my son's been a cop. They're going to the highest crime parts of every city. So let's get, you know, more allies involved in working with us, and let's connect the dots for them. So the takeaway messages for communities of color, for African American churches, for Hispanic churches, is a new big marijuana industry is going to target the most vulnerable of us, just like big tobacco and the liquor lobby have, and the impact of marijuana use, make no mistake about it, they're regressive. If you're a kid who's going to Harvard and you're gonna have 140 IQ, and this is one of the problems we have, and you go down to eight points and you have 132 IQ, you're still a friggin' genius. But most people's kids aren't going to Harvard and their kids aren't geniuses. So if you start out with a shot at life at 100, which is average, and you end up at a 92, your life is basically ruined. That is the message. So. Just to sort of be wrapping it up, I said this yesterday too, there's all of these diseases that people are claiming marijuana is great for. Glaucoma is one of them. Go to the Glaucoma Society's website. There is a gigantic warning on their homepage. Gigantic warning. Marijuana for glaucoma, patients beware. 
Okay, it does reduce ocular pressure, but unless you're stoned 24 seven, it makes you blind. Don't use it. Marijuana is contraindicated for a lot of the supposed things that it's a miracle drug for, and we have to get the message out there because this is dangerous to regular people. Okay, I'm gonna do this really quickly. Everybody knows, or we all know, most people don't. Uh, for the medical marijuana dispensaries, the vast majority of users are not sick and dying. They don't have cancer or HIV or MS. They're just the people wheeled out when they are trying to pass these initiatives. Most people who use medical marijuana are all white males, 30 to 40, already big problems with substance abuse and addiction. So the takeaway message, and Stu Gitlow did a brilliant job explaining why we don't chew willow bark to get the effects of aspirin, but we also don't smoke opium to get the effects of morphine, okay? We don't do any of this stuff. We actually have medicines in a process, so we shouldn't be smoking marijuana to obtain its medical benefits. And there is something called Sativex, which is about hopefully to be approved in the United States, been approved in Canada and across Europe, which is an oral mouth spray that actually does distill down the cannabinoids that have some medical benefit, and you don't have to smoke it and it doesn't get you high. So we're, we're almost there on that. But we need more traction with the media. I do think we need a lot more social media. We need stuff that's attractive, that's funny, that's short, that's pithy, that can get the attention of people. We need a million hits on YouTube, on stuff that we're gonna be doing. I think we really need to put some, some money and some effort there. Um, and, and I wanna sort of, before I turn it over to John Redman, really just tell you, Katka has been involved in fighting these marijuana initiatives for 20 years, from day one, from the first time this happened. Um, we, you know, I'm not gonna go through everything we do, but I think those of you know we have fought this, we've helped you fight it, we've done toolkits and letters to the editor, and we have mobilized you, and we have General Dean has written letters to legislatures in every state that's faced this. He's thanked people who have voted it the right way on it. He's, you know, asked that these things be vetoed by governors. I mean, we've really, really been tremendously involved. But this is not the only thing CATGA does, okay? We make sure there's money for all of you and that the Drug-Free Communities Program is there and that the STOP Act is there and that all the money for our field is there. And so this is one thing we do. We do a lot. I have the best staff in the world. I think Kelly Lupo is here and I have Lindsay Hoff back in the office the best staff in the world, but we're doing a lot, and marijuana is one of the things we do. So why do we partner with Sam? Because we can't do it all. We can't go into every state and do a political campaign, but you guys are the ground troops for everybody, for us, for Sam, for everything else that has to do with alcohol, tobacco, and drug prevent, for David Jernigan when it comes to his alcohol advertising and taxing stuff. You guys are amazing. But we have partnered with Sam because when it gets to political campaigns and sort of, you know, fighting and doing political campaigns, that's not what CATCA does. So we are very happy to have John Redman here who has really done a brilliant job helping with Sam. He's a coalition leader, he's one of us. We've worked really, really closely with these guys and I'm gonna turn it over to my really good friend and wonderful, wonderful advocate and someone who's really fought the fight in California, John Redman. Thank you, Sue. Um, CADFI's been around for about 32 years and, and we've been supporters of CADCA for as long as they've been around. And, and uh, I just can't thank Sue enough for all of her support and General Dean for all of his. You know, it's, uh, it's been difficult as we've had to deal with some of the things that we're, we're not exactly used to. You know, it's been our job as coalition leaders to really deal with uh, environmental change in our communities. But when we work in our communities, in our neighborhoods, and then at the state level, they start to work on either, whether it's uh, initiatives or, or state statues that will come down like a tidal wave in our own communities and change everything that we've been working on for years in the matter of a single vote. 
we've all had to start to change our thinking and work in a different way. Um, you know, and just because an initiative comes down doesn't mean that it's a a absolutely going to change anything. For example, Prop 215, which was uh, the medical marijuana proposition in California, was voted in 1996. Nothing happened for many, many years, almost a decade. Then in 2005, the people that had worked on that said, well, what does that mean? Why, why isn't anything happening? Well, there was this initiative, but nobody, there was no concept of how that would actually happen on the ground level. So there was a group of people in 2005 that started to get together, since nothing had happened at the state level, even with this initiative, to go through at the local level, city by city, county by county. So I want to get back to what David said. It all happens at the local level. And all, so they got some friendly counties in the state of California in 2005 to start to move forward on what they thought Prop 215 would look like. And it was a jumbled mess. And at some point in time, they said, well, let's just forget all this medical marijuana stuff and go to full legalization, which is really something that they had wanted to do in the past. And uh, that's when, that's when it, we had started to deal as CADFI, dealing with the stuff that happened uh, from years before. So we had gone through that, and we had actually pushed back and, and stopped Proposition 19, which was the first legal, uh, w w the first uh, initiative to fully legalize marijuana, and it happened in California in 2010. Now, we had done some other, it actually dealt with some other statutes that were happening at the state level in uh, Assembly Bill 390 and some other things that always come out of Sacramento from the from the uh, assembly members in San Francisco. Why it all comes out in San Francisco, who knows? But uh, that's where it starts. And we had to start to deal with some of that stuff. And we were at least a little prepared in 2010, but not really. Uh, we had dealt with the stuff in 2010, and actually it, it was defeated. Some, th because of what we had done, but I want to be really clear, it was also because they weren't ready on their side to really take it from this medical marijuana to full legalization. They weren't ready. They had only raised about, well, in the end, they, they raised about a million dollars to get the signatures and then another million to do some of the, the work, which wasn't enough to really pass an initiative in California. It's going to take about $10 million. They didn't have it. So we were lucky. I, you know, I thank Sue for all the things that she says about our coalition and many other coalitions across the state of California, but we were lucky. If we had to go through the same thing today in California in the same way, we would lose. Mm -hmm. We would lose because what happened in 2010 is not what would happen today. And I want to fast forward you two years to 2012. Because what happened in 2012 was not what happened in 2010. Right, Derek? <laughs> Washington and Colorado and the coalitions there had to face something much grander on a much larger scale than we had to deal with in California. And what's going to happen in 2014? Maybe not much, but in 2016, you can bet your backside that that's that is going to be the year that there will be a major push in the United States for full legalization in a number of states, and it will make what Washington and Colorado had to go through look like kindergarten. In January of this year, a number of pro-legalization groups, all of them, met in San Francisco at the Cow Palace and came up with a national strategy of what they would do. And one of those strategies was, let's hold off in 2014 and build our war chest. We know it's gonna take $10 million to, for California. Here's a list of the other states that we want. That will take about 11 million. And so we'll need about $21 million to make this work and let's raise money. That's what they're doing. So what is Sam doing 
And that's exactly what Sue was saying. CADCA can advocate, CADCA can train you, and you guys are the best trained in the world. And I love CADCA for that and respect each and every one of you out there for what you do. But now at the next level, to have to deal with this, the political issues was something that I wasn't prepared for. And I know, Derek, how did you feel? Yes. Completely, it was like a tsunami that hit us, wasn't it? And I, and I don't know if anyone is here from Colorado. I know you felt the same way too. And Kevin and I uh, worked with you and it was a tsunami. We, we can't be on the defensive. We can't sit and lie in wait and have something like this mm -hmm. come up in 2016 and be completely and totally unprepared. And so that's what SAM and the Interstate Alliance is all about, to help take everything that CADCA has trained you on, everything that you know in environmental strategies, and then maybe give you some of the experiences that we've had going into that next level from California, from Washington, from Colorado. That's what the Interstate Alliance is all about. To understand the difference between a 501c3 and a 501c4, to understand what a PAC is, to understand what a ballot committee is, and it, so that you're prepared and feel comfortable about being able to do what we know all of you can do, which is push this, this 100 ma uh, mile an hour freight train back, or at least derail it a little bit. I'd even be for that. So we, the idea is to create, to separate groups working on advocacy, but being able to transition them into lobbying groups, but take the necessary proper actions to do so. But it's not just about prevention, it's about bringing the right people to the table, the need to put on political advocacy in our lobbying hats and find, or find someone who can. The experience that Sue Thaw has had in that for over two decades is exactly the knowledge that we need at that next level. So after the, the uh, loss of Washington and Colorado, uh, Kevin and I after we licked our wounds and got out of our fetal position from crying, uh, was to say, okay, what are, we, what are we gonna do? And it was through Patrick Kennedy, uh, who wanted to really start to look at this issue and said, this is not what is good for the health of the nation on a public health standpoint and move forward. And, and Kevin spent a lot of time creating messages, looking at what this is, considering the, uh, the, the problems of big tobacco and, and big alcohol and, and form SAM. But it, it wasn't enough to do that. It was, were we going to be able, not just to be you know, a think tank or uh, uh, talking heads, but actually organizing groups and, and get them in a, in a boot camp, so to speak, and get them uh, down to fighting weight to be able to, to, to go after uh, these tidal waves that came into our community. And we had an opportunity to do that uh, in, in Hawaii. Uh, and this year, Hawaii was looking at uh, a decrim bill that was really full legalization. Uh, and coalitions uh, from Hawaii asked for our help. Uh, so we had to figure out ways to help them very quickly. It was within weeks that we went out there uh, and uh, they invited Kevin Patrick Kennedy and myself to go out there and see if we could talk to coalitions, community groups, and the legislature on what they were, what road they were going down. We first visited the Haida headquarters just to let people know who we were and what we were there for, the U.S. attorney, the chiefs of police, the sheriffs. Uh, and, uh, but then we went right over to Capitol Hill and we were introduced to the legislature so that they knew who we were and why we were there. And then we gave a legislative briefing. Uh, Patrick Kennedy, uh, Kevin, myself, and that was a briefing that on issues that they had never heard before. As a matter of fact, numerous legislators said, we never heard this argument before. We never heard some of the things that you were saying. As a matter of fact, had you had said this months ago, we'd never have been this far on this bill. And we were actually quite stunned by it. So uh, uh, that was even while we were being introduced to the legislator, they, uh, they were even looking on our SAM website. So we were happy to see that they took an active part in it. 
We then had a, a press conference uh, at the state, at the Big Island, uh, with the with the head of the police department chief, Maui PD, legislators, treatment doctors, prevention people. We had two community meetings in Hawaii. Who's here from Hawaii? Anyone? Excellent. You guys were, were amazing. The, the, the support that we had going there uh, to Hawaii, it made our job so much easier. These guys in Hawaii knew how to mobilize and they had connections to very important people that let allowed us to be able to talk about the messaging there. Um, we had a meeting with the Hawaii Chamber of Commerce. So just like Sue was talking about, all the problems that were that will would happen with with the industry, we let uh, the Chamber of Commerce know. And 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 we have to remember that every state, every region is going to be different. And we looked at Hawaii and said, you know, what does Hawaii look like? How are they, where are they getting their income from in terms of a state? What's important to them? And there were two things that came to the top right away. One was a close partnership with the military. There's a huge military component there in Hawaii that does not want to have an environment of, of marijuana for their young sailors. They didn't want that. That wasn't good. Hawaii would not be good partners with the military if that was to occur. The second was one of the biggest income makers for Hawaii is what? Tourism. A lot of tourism comes from the Asian community from Japan. I went to high school there. I'm very familiar with that. And they are not supportive of, of drug use. And they don't want to bring their families to a place to vacation where marijuana smoking is prevalent. They didn't want it. So those were two things that we talked about that they had not considered. The legislature mm -hmm. had not considered. And when it, when it gets down to it, what's important to, to the people there? So we had uh, uh, some uh, two meetings at the Big Island, press conference on the Big Island. Uh, we had a meeting in uh, Lanai, a community meeting there. What a gorgeous place. Thank you for allowing me to work in a, in a, in a utopia like that. Anyway, some uh, pictures. I hate to show this picture because it's from this picture right here, right now, that my wife has me on a diet. So I wish I knew Photoshop. I could just, but I can't. Anyway, so, um, but the result was de facto legalization failed on the House floor. They had the votes, folks. It was fast tracked. They had moved it so fast because they had such support. It was going to happen. We sat there. We talked to them about very reasonable, very, very important public health issues, and they lost the votes. Woo. Uh, several members changed their votes. Support couldn't be garnered. They couldn't get new votes. Hawaii will not have legalization this year. Their legislative uh, uh, session ended in May, and so it won't even be considered till next year. But also, while we can we we can we can uh, be happy about that, we cannot rest on our laurels, or or uh, or our lays. <laughs> we can't. We cannot rest on that. It will come back next year, and we have to be ready for it. We have to be prepared. We have to get out in front. No more playing defense, folks. Today, we start playing offense. Yeah. yeah. Ohio. Kevin and Sue also went to Ohio, where they met with uh, coalitions there and community leaders there and got support. And with Drug Free Action Alliance, uh, who coordinated the visit, they are now ready to move forward as well. So these are just examples, and we have, I think, 12 official uh, alliance members, but I also know there's there's over a dozen ready to become alliance members and get the training and uh, be ready for uh, for the issues that they're going to have in their state. We want to create a movement, like Sue said. That's what we want to do: train people up, get them on the offensive, get you guys down to fighting weight, get me down to fighting weight, and be ready to to deal with the issues that that come up in in your communities and in your states. Um, Sue and Kevin learned about Ohio's needs about major workforce issues. They had a friendly governor and political climate and medical marijuana legislation pending. So uh, coalition set up major events, legislative briefings, community business leader briefings, 
all talking about uh, issues that they had not heard about in the past. Uh, here's Kevin and Sue. Beautiful. <laughs> um, but what, so what I want to get down to is, you know, as you know, Kevin, I'm going to do a shameless plug for Kevin. As you know, Kevin has written a book, and it, it really is a culmination of all of the, the lessons learned out there uh, in the field, uh, things, issues that, that we've had to deal with, that Kevin's had to deal with in debates. And uh, so the seven myths are the seven issues, the top seven issues that the other side is going to say, uh, going to, to press you with, and you'll be able to talk about those. It is, uh, it is uh, footnoted or endnoted so with every piece of research there. I encourage each and every one of you to get it uh, so that you can be ready and also use it to give it to other people uh, who are uh, looking at this issue, whether it's policy makers or, or community leaders or, or you know, environmental groups, whatever. Get this book to them just as a, as a starting point to have that discussion. Um, I think we're, uh, I, I want to get you to lunch, so, uh, but, but I definitely uh, want you to realize that we, we are out there, we are here to help. Uh, there are some major uh, uh, offensive movements happening and some uh, major positive effects, like Kevin said, with uh, Colorado. Uh, and just so you know, in the state of California with 728 cities, there are only 40 that have approved ordinances for medical marijuana. So it isn't all bad out there, and we can push the tide back. We can do it with, with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to break for lunch, but afterwards, we're going to, thank you, John, I appreciate that. We're going to take uh, questions that you might have had since we didn't have time during the session. And then we're really going to go through um, the, uh, some breakouts in your region to really, again, assess the policy environment in your region, assess your action to date so that we can have a dialogue about that, your partnerships, opportunities, and then action from here. Because we, we do want this to say, either continue something you've already started, keep it going, I will be signing books. By the way, if you're from near Lufkin, Texas, and you bought a book, come to me. And if your zip code is 29203 and you bought a book, <laughs> come to me. And if you bought one yesterday with your credit card, also come see me. I have a message for you. And it's not that you've been overcharged. Don't worry. Um, thank you, everybody. We'll see you soon. <laughs>